Good morning, everyone. It is 9 a.m. live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City. I'm Brad Smith alongside Diane King Hall, and this is Yahoo Finance Live. Here is your morning rundown. Today is the day. The Fed will almost certainly keep rates unchanged, with investors eagerly anticipating signals about where the FOMC is leaning for future policy. The Treasury this morning seemingly responding to those higher rates, outlining plans to step up the size of future bond sales. And it's a new month. Stocks closed October lower for the third straight month of declines. Will we be better off in November? Well, cheaper meals are king. Yum Brands restaurants, Taco Bell and KFC top same store sales estimates as consumers turn to more affordable options. Kraft Heinz beat on profit and raised its annual forecast thanks to margin improvement from higher prices, though overall volumes declined slightly, signaling the price hikes have begun to take a toll on consumers. And give it time. Tip maker AMD softer than expected fourth quarter guidance spooked investors, sparking a drop in extended trading. But shares recovered after AMD gave a rosy 2024 forecast for its AI chip business on an earnings call. CEO Lisa Su saying generative AI's growth potential is in early innings and with more adoption to come. This as leaders from around the world, including Elon Musk, kick off an AI safety summit in the UK. The goal there? to start developing global safety standards around the new technology. Well, today's morning driver, the Fed's great rate debate here. The Federal Reserve will announce its latest policy decision on Wednesday. Wall Street expecting the central bank will hold rates steady at a 22-year high, but retaining the option to further raise rates if needed. In a new note out from Bank of America's Michael Gapin, the economist expects the Fed to pause rates, but shows concern that officials are, quote, ignoring rate market signals at their own peril. Bank of America analysts reaffirmed their expectation that there will be one more rate increase in December. And there you're taking a look at the CME Fed watch tool probability as of right now. This has been moving around quite a bit since the last meeting, but overwhelmingly that movement has been towards no movement on yep. the policy front, at least on the rates. Uh, and we'll see what the tenor of the conversation looks like when the meetings come out, uh, the meeting minutes come out week from it's, weeks from now. It's true. I mean, like, you're right. There is a little bit of a change, but still the majority lean with the expectation of the Fed to hold the line, although we know that the Fed that is keeping the door open to additional rate hikes as we see some commentators still expect to see another one, whether it's in December or in early 2024, remains to be seen because we know they've continued to uh, reaffirm, reiterate the message that this is a data dependent Fed. They always say that, you know, we know that PCE is the preferred uh, measure of inflation that the Fed likes to look to to set the direction of where rates are going. But again, largely the consensus is that this Fed will hold the line at this meeting when it concludes today. And it's really interesting. And in terms of some of the commentary that has come out from economists, from some of the largest uh, managers of, uh, of assets under management, BlackRock particularly, they had mentioned in some notes leading up to this, this decision and this meeting that has come forward uh, for the FOMC, this November meeting, that a great deal has happened at markets since the Fed last met. One of those things uh, that they did mention, the incoming data in recent months underscoring their conviction, at least, that they're seeing a meaningful inflation improvement there alongside a labor market that is becoming more balanced in terms of supply and demand, even in spite of strong recent GDP growth. So to them, that increases the probability of a soft landing or right. a Goldilocks environment for the U.S. economy, at least in the near term. They yeah, say. and we know that just kind of brings up the dual mandate of the Fed. It's, right. you know, watching uh, where inflation is um, and then the employment picture. And we know that the employment, uh, the state of the labor market has been very robust and very strong. And it's that kind of that balancing act, really walking a tightrope on uh, not necessarily breaking the labor market, mm -hmm. but, you know, what is that point where it's kind of just right, not too hot, not too cold, the Goldilocks scenario that you just mentioned? Yeah, they don't want to be, you know, too quick to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, they don't want to be too quick to ultimately um, declare that the inflation has improved so much so that it doesn't require any more policy, uh, especially considering they don't want a repeat of what we've seen in the past decades back. Right. Um, where there was a research in, resurgence in inflation and then even tighter policy had to be enacted. Yeah, and one more quick factoid. If the Fed holds rates steady at this meeting, as expected, this would be the first time it's done this again, like kept it in mm -hmm. two consecutive meetings yeah. in a row since 
March of 2022. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. Also out this morning, a much anticipated announcement from the Treasury. It will increase the size of its bond auctions in a much awaited refunding plan. It will start with an auction of $112 billion next week to refund $102.2 billion of T notes set to mature November 15th. That particular sale will come in three parts. The issuance of fresh bonds comes amid a growing debt pile and a higher for longer rates backdrop. We just talked about that. Such moves can cause volatility for all asset classes, especially bonds and equities. Now, earlier this week, the Treasury said it would need to borrow some $776 billion in the current quarter. So that's another aspect of this puzzle to watch. Well, a potential Fed pause is on the horizon. Wall Street expects the Federal Reserve to keep rates steady on Wednesday as economic data leaves open the possibility of future hikes. For more on what to expect from the Fed this afternoon, we've got Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schoenberger. Jen, what are you expecting? What are you anticipating? What's the vibe uh, going into this decision? Good morning, Brad. Fed officials just convened the second day of their two-day policy meeting here in Washington, where they are widely expected to hold rates steady in the range of five and a quarter to five and a half percent. Now, how much long-term bond yields have soared is likely to feature prominently in officials' discussions about whether another rate hike is still needed and how long the central bank will hold rates around current levels. In the weeks leading up to the meeting, a chorus of Fed officials acknowledging that higher bond yields may have done the work of another rate hike, making another one unnecessary. Goldman Sachs estimates that the roughly 50 basis point run up in long term bond yields is the equivalent of four quarter point rate hikes, so a full percentage point there. Wall Street, of course, pricing in that the Fed has reached the peak on their benchmark policy rate altogether for this year. But Fed officials are likely to keep that door open to rate hikes to preserve their options in the wake of much stronger than expected economic data. Ahead of the meeting, Fed Chair Jay Powell said the central bank would proceed carefully given uncertainties, risks, and how much the Fed has already hiked rates already. But he warned that inflation is still too high and that more interest rate increases are still possible if the economy or job market stays surprisingly hot. With no new interest rate projections and no major changes to the policy statement expected, all eyes will be on Fed Chair Jay Powell this afternoon in his press conference and how he will guide for monetary policy. Powell expected to continue walking that tightrope of proceeding cautiously, but still keeping interest rate hikes on the table to preserve options in the face of stronger than expected economic data. It all comes down at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Guys. All right. Great reporting as usual. Jen Schoenberger, thank you so much. We know you're going to be busy today. <laughs> Thanks, Diane. Meantime, markets are, you got it, markets are starting November off with a bang as investors anticipate a deluge of information that can move stocks and treasury yields. First, we've got results bonanza. Quarterly reports come in from several sectors, including consumer staples, travel, consumer discretionary, financials, and tech. Then we've got two events that can have major impacts on Treasury yields coming from the Federal Reserve and Treasury Department. First, the Treasury announced its bond issuance program for the fourth quarter. And this afternoon, Fed Chair Jay Powell takes the stage to announce the committee's interest rate decision. With so much information on tap for the day, where should investors be focused? We want to bring in Victoria Fernandez, Crossmark Global Investments Chief market strategist. So thanks so much for joining us again this morning. So with all of this in front of us, where should investors be focused, Victoria? Yeah, you're right. There's a lot of information coming at us, uh, not just today, but this week in general. And we add to that the jolts information, which I think is going to be a key component for us to watch in regards to what's going to happen with the labor market and what the Fed may be looking at. Um, so what do, what do you do with all of this? Well, I think you need to be a little bit conservative. With our clients, we're talking about having that diversification, that balanced portfolio right now. And we don't want to be out of the market, right? With longer term investments. You want to be in the market. You want to be able to take advantage. But I think you have to be very thoughtful about where you're putting your money to work in the market. We're not placing large bets in certain sectors, but there are areas that we like. We like healthcare. We've been investing in some of the healthcare space. We think you can do some of the tech, not necessarily that magnificent seven. You don't need to go in and start buying some of that. But 
other names that we own, like Adobe, we think there's places you can go in within tech and still be there, but you want to have exposure to other areas. The bond market, look at the yields. You guys have been talking about yields and where they are, the treasury refunding announcement that's coming in the auctions we're going to see. You can get a 5% on a short-term treasury. That makes sense in a diversified portfolio as well. One other thing, Diane, I think people need to look at in this type of a, a environment, this uncertain environment, look Look at some alternative spaces that you have, whether it's something like a covered call strategy, um, whether it's something like an absolute return strategy that you can use. There's different elements, I think, because of the uncertainty and volatility in the markets that you can build in your portfolio. Well, what is the overall theme that you've been kind of taking away from this earnings season so far, Victoria? Yeah, well, you know, we always thought people were being a little bit optimistic um, with the earnings, but we look at where we are right now. We've got about 78% of companies that have reported that have had upside surprises. The interesting thing to this, Brad, is that even with 78% surprising to the upside, only 38% of uh, stock prices are actually um, having positive reactions. Even if they beat expectations, mm -hmm. The average right now is for the stock to trade down 1%. So it tells us that there's some concern over the earnings. You look at that phrase, weak demand, that is being mentioned at a number of times that is typically what you hear in a recessionary environment. So I think companies are laying out their guidance to say, look, Things haven't been too bad. We're beating expectations for this third quarter, but we're really concerned about what's coming. We're concerned about the consumer. And so I think they're starting to lay some of that cautious guidance for the fourth quarter and for next year. And I wouldn't be surprised to see those earnings expectation numbers for 2024 come down. 12% just looks really high for us. Victoria, is that in terms of the earnings expectations, is that pegged to is some of this pegged to the slowdown that we're starting to see with consumers? Um, and are you worried about the state of the consumer currently? Yeah, so the consumer has really been kind of that underlying foundation for this economy. When we look over the last year, things that are telling us we typically should be in a recession, right? The leading economic indicators being negative for what, 18 months in a row, the M2 supply uh, growth numbers, all of these things telling us we should be in a recession, but the consumer has been there. Now, disposable income for this year, the first nine months of this year was actually up 3%. That's really strong for the consumer. And because their net worth is moving higher, they're not having to go into the savings or um, put as much savings away as they have historically. So I still think there's some support there for the consumer. As you guys know, we're going into this holiday season. November and December seasonally are quite strong for the equity markets. So I don't want to count the consumer out, um, especially in the U.S. The consumer is always there to support the economy, but I definitely think we'll see some normalizing and some pulling back. Let's watch credit cards over the next couple of months. If we see credit card spending and revolving debt increase dramatically, then I think we have to look at concerns for the consumer in early 2024. You know, there, there's a few things at play with the consumer for sure, and we're going to get more of those retail companies that report towards the latter half of this earnings season. But from what you've heard from some of the, the CPG companies, even from the food and beverage companies that have all in some cases needed to pass along price to the consumer. Uh, mm -hmm. And in different instances, we've seen where that price is realized and where uh, there's been a pushback because volumes might have taken a, a bit of a hit. All that considered, is this a consumer right now that is showing any signs of at least recession fatigue in how much it's been talked about, how much it's been a consideration or a concern uh, of, a, of a soft landing or a hard landing or a shallow recession or a mild recession for the better part of a year at this point? Yeah, it's definitely been the hot topic of conversation, and it's all tied to the strength of the labor market and wages moving higher. Um, we've seen wages start to moderate a little bit. I mentioned when we first started our conversation, the jolts number coming out. Let's look at that quits rate. The quits rate actually leads the employment cost index by a couple of quarters. So if we see quits start to slow down, that should tell us that maybe we'll see wages come back a little bit as well. 
well. Um, again, all of this feeding into the strength of that consumer that we have, it has been a topic that we've been concerned with because it's been, I think, what has kept us from having the recession. Now, pricing power of companies, as you mentioned, has been strong, but as inflation starts to come down, although it is coming down slowly at this point, as inflation starts to come down, those companies will lose some of that pricing power. Um, we have to see whether disposable income continues to hold for the consumer, allowing them to spend, or whether they start to pull back a little bit. That story um, is still something that we'll have to watch and see what happens. And Victoria, really quickly, uh, before we let you go, I want to ask you, obviously, uh, there's a big focus on the Fed today, um, but a lot are looking beyond what actually comes out of today's meeting. What's your expectation? What you, what, where are you trying to read the tea leaves beyond today's uh, outcome? Right. Everyone's trying to guess what's going to happen in December. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Fed actually stays on hold through the end of this year and then wants to see kind of how much of the 525 basis points works its way through the economy in this last quarter of the year. And if they're going to hike again, which I actually think they probably will, I think we have to look at maybe early 2024 for that. To Okay. Be listening for that um, idea of duration of the pause. And um, I think that's going to be a clue for us as to whether we get another hike in December or whether it moves in to the first quarter of next year. Victoria Fernandez, Crossmark Global Investments Chief Market Strategist, joining us here this morning. Victoria, great to have you here with us. Thanks for kicking off the day here with Yahoo Finance. My pleasure. All right, guys. Well, switching gears here, we're watching shares of CVS this morning after the company saw sales rise almost 11% from last year, boosted by its cost-cutting implementations last quarter, but slashed its full-year unadjusted earnings forecast. But trouble could be on the horizon for the healthcare giant as it faces a nationwide walkout staged by employees over working conditions, which they claim are putting customers at risk. Megan Fitzgerald, Grey Ghost Advisors, PE Investor, and Columbia University Healthcare Policy Professor joins us now to discuss. Uh, Megan, a uh, lot to get into here, and, and we'll get to the walkouts. First, want to get your take, kind of broad strokes, on what they had to report on, on the sales front and ultimately the health of the business, if you will. Nice to see you. So I think uh, they beat on the top and bottom line. Not a surprise. If you look back, they have a predictable record of, um, you know, beating estimates. So I think revenues being ahead of consensus, driven by the healthcare services segment, which really bodes well for their strategy. As you know, they spent about $10 billion uh, buying new assets to get into the home and also you know, extending their vertical integration strategy to give direct care, prescription care, and health insurance benefits through Aetna. So I think this is an affirmation of that strategy. Uh, they also did a nice job on the cost cutting, uh, eliminating 5,000 jobs. So that strong OPEX management and that revenue growth really allowed the revenue to drop right to the bottom line uh, on the EPS line. However, I think what the street is upset about here in pre-market trading is they lowered their full year unadjusted earnings and they painted a somewhat modest outlook for the second half of uh, 23. And Megan, I want to ask you, something that's come up within this space is uh, the pharmacists and, and labor concerns there. You have this walkout of some pharmacists going on strike as well. Is there any cause for concern from your view in terms of how it affects uh, the balance sheet for CVS? Yeah, I think the, the concern really is the ability to serve. They did see some softness in the front store prescriptions. They didn't tie that directly to labor. But when you have walkouts and, you know, the large that's their largest workforce is their pharmacists. They're known for being a pharmacy forward, uh, you know, asset. And so when you have so many pharmacists that are, you know, upset and walking out uh, and demanding uh, better pay and better benefits, I think it is a concern. So we'll see how that's handled in the next week. I think today was the third day of that walkout. I remember going to my CVS here in downtown Naples uh, and on a Saturday and it was closed because there was not a pharmacist. The next day when I went back in, they said, hey, we just got redeployed to a pharmacy that had higher volume we're doing what we can. 
and I thought the spirit of the pharmacist was right. She was mostly concerned about patient care, but certainly having a busy pharmacy uh, closed down because of a lack of staff is certainly a concern. And we're seeing that in all of healthcare, uh, including you know nurses on the front line feeling the same way. Megan, from what we've heard from some of the bio uh, excuse me, biopharmaceutical companies over the course of this earnings season, uh, companies like Pfizer really getting out this this message to the street that, hey, you know, as much as there is kind of a a post COVID pandemic uh, society that we're all navigating through, the the need for vaccinations is not nearly what it was, or at least the administration of them not nearly what it was when you had countries making large purchase orders for hundreds of millions. So now, how does that transition into a company like CVS as well, impacting foot traffic, the number of people that are coming in, and then that knock-on effect to some of the retail aisles as well? Yeah, we clearly have more vaccine than we have takers. So uh, CVS stated that this morning on the call that the vaccine uh, uptake is down. Everyone has said that. Even Pfizer, uh, you know, took their forecast down due, due to vaccines. So everyone is now coming forward to say, um, you know, vaccine uptake and, and banking on a pandemic uptick due to vaccines, due to foot traffic, because people are coming in to get vaccines is clearly not playing out. So I think what you're seeing in healthcare right now is some cyclical weakness, but structural strength because patients still are getting older. And in fact, recent reports show that healthcare as a percent of GDP could very well tick back up to 20%, which was the peak. So we kind of have this dislocation right now in healthcare where people need more care, they're getting older, chronic disease is, is obviously a big issue that's front and center, but this idea of banking on uh, kind of the pandemic as, as a boon to earnings is clearly not playing out anymore. All right, Megan, we'll have to put a pin in our conversation for today. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Megan Fitzgerald, Grey Ghost Advisor, is PE Investor and Columbia University Healthcare Policy Professor. Meanwhile, the criminal trial of FTX founder Sam Bankman Fried moves into closing arguments today. The man, once known as Crypto's White Knight, has pleaded not guilty to all seven fraud related charges. They were brought after the collapse of FTX and hedge fund Alameda Research last November. His decision to testify in his defense is being viewed as a critical moment in the trial as the jury begins its deliberations. Bankman Fried faces a potential life sentence if convicted. Covering the case throughout and joining us now is Yahoo Finance's own Alexis Keenan. Alexis, uh, take us through this wild ride and kind of maybe the end chapter that we're in right now. Of course, yes. So as you said, closing statements expected today. That means the jury could get the case as soon as today. But Bankman Freed's testimony, really a make or break uh, of his defense, as it is for most defendants who choose, criminal defendants who choose to take the stand. And while it's very hard to predict what jurors think, Bankman Freed's answers on cross examination that he did not recall really key events and key aspects of FTX's exchanges relationship with Alameda Research, the hedge fund, the crypto hedge fund that Bankman Freed also ran, uh, that he didn't remember those aspects of those statements to investors, to lenders, also to reporters, and his own public statements on Twitter, that really risks uh, his testimony being perhaps unpersuasive. Now, Bankman Fried often said things like, and this I quote, I don't recall learning exactly that. And that's kind of the flavor that he had there on cross-examination while the prosecutors were asking him questions. Now, the thrust of Bankman Fried's defense, though, is that as CEO, he was really focused on the big picture of these companies and that he didn't know until October of 2022 that FTX customers were being spent by Alameda for its trading, for its loans, for real estate purchases, and for political donations. Uh, he said that so long as on net Alameda and FTX's assets exceeded liabilities, he believed that it was permissible for Alameda to borrow and use customer funds 
in accounts that opted into FDX's margin trading program. Now, as for the government's case, prosecutors say that Bankman Freed knew that it was never okay to use customer funds and to spend them, and that he and his former executives, Caroline Ellison, Gary Wong, as well as Nishad Singh, made Alameda's access to those funds possible, and the testimony from those former executives is really some of the government's strongest evidence in this case. Those three former executives, as we know, pled guilty already, and they have admitted to uh, this scheme being a fraud against customers, lenders, investors. I'll be heading back into court, though, uh, in just moments when closing arguments are supposed to take place, and we will bring you the latest from the courtroom. Guys? All right. Most people get a haircut for their hearings, but we'll see if anything differs on this day. Yahoo Finance's Alexis Keenan, thanks so much for joining us. And all the SBF drama that's been unfolding here. All your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. They command multi-billion dollar empires and dominate the boardroom. I admit when I'm wrong. What you want to do is control your controllables. Decisions that impact your investments are made by them every single day. Profit and purpose go hand in hand. Now, Yahoo Finance grants you exclusive access to these titans of industry. Discover the motivations behind industry-altering decisions and the visionaries who imprint their legacy on the world's most renowned companies. Join us for our groundbreaking series, Lead This Way.
you've got the opening bell loud there, kicking off a new month <laughs> on Wall Street happening? as we head into, really, it looks like the holiday season. They're cheering early. Uh, that's the opening bell on Wall Street. We want to get a quick check of the markets as we head into a new month of trading. It, it, indications were for things to be range bound, but we want to get right over to Jared Blickery, Professor Jared, what are you watching as we kick off a new month? New month. We got a little bit of green to start the day. Still waiting for some of those opening prints and the indices to come in. But it looks like, for the most part, we're seeing more green than red. And taking a look at the sector action, that is the case. Only healthcare and materials in the red there. And just by a little bit. Consumer discretionary and tech, those are in the leaders. Uh, consumer discretionary is XLY. That's up about six tenths of a percent. Also have real estate as an outperformer. Energy on the top line as well, but not a bit, uh, not a lot of big movement that I'm tracking. Um, just looking at the Nasdaq 100 components here, looks like Tesla up one and a half percent. That's some dark green that we're seeing. AMD. Chip stock also up 1%. Netflix also up a little bit. Uh, still looking for some of those big outliers. And then when I take a look at the leaders, we're seeing some love for the fringier parts of the market. Meme stocks up there with value. That's pretty interesting. Each of those up more than 1%. Gambling, IPOs, uh, also some small oil play. All of those getting some love at the top. To the downside, MJ, which is cannabis. That has just been trending lower over the, fast, over, over the last month. And we saw that huge drop off from that early peak when we had the legislation in the U.S. look like uh, the DEA was going to change her scheduling, but those gains have been given back. Now let's take a look at the energy sector. That has been one of the more volatile sectors, and today we're seeing more green than red there. It looks like uh, Chesapeake up about 2 percent, and uh, we can see down about 6.7 percent for the year. Energy, by the way, was the biggest gainer last year by far and has uh, uh, kind of taken a slump this year, a backseat to those mega caps. Now, here we're taking a look at the banking sector. UBS uh, looking like an outlier. That's up over 1%. Uh, let me check on the regional banks as well. Uh, we are seeing them sell off quite a bit over the last few days. And now another sea of red here for those regional banks. Uh, the interest rate, uh, the, uh, you know, there's a lot going on with the bond market. We have the Treasury Barry Advisory Committee. They have made their recommendations to the Treasury. We've been talking about those increased auction sizes. I'm going to be doing a deep dive of those on those in the 10 a.m. hour and the 11 a.m. hour. 11 a.m. hour. And then we have the Fed today. So huge, huge movements in the bond market, but probably not till later. A lot of times on these days we see FOMC drift. That is, the market is kind of quiet and it drifts upwards into that announcement that we get at 2 p.m. And we really don't even see any fireworks until we get uh, Powell taking the lectern at 2.30 p.m. So stand by for that. Just taking a quick look at the movies and entertainment uh, sphere today. Looks like, what is this, Six Flags? Uh, we are seeing some downward movement in that. Um, but overall, not seeing too much there. Let's take a look at the travel sector as well. Mixed board, but more red than green. Airbnb down four tenths of a percent, booking up eight tenths of a percent. Um, I'm not reading a lot into today's market action. I'm going to close with the Dow here. Looks like Boeing is an outperformer in the Dow. Uh, let's hope that November finds its footing a little bit better than October. I'm going to end with this look at November seasonality. We have the upper line is what has happened since 1950. That's that purple line right there. The blue line, which does tick, uh, tick up at the very end here, see if you can see that, that is in the third year of the presidential cycle. So that's that four-year cycle. Suffice to say, maybe we'll get some tailwinds towards the end of the month. I think investors could use that after the drubbing they've taken over the last three months. All right, Jared Blickery, we'll leave it there. All right, let's take a look at some individual movers. It's what we're watching. Uh, Pizza Hut, same store sales, took a bite out of Yum Brand's performance this latest quarter. Shares of Yum have been under, uh, they're kind of range bound this morning after missing the street's revenue expectations for the third quarter. For a deeper dive into the company's latest results, we're joined by our very own Brooke De Palma. Brooke, give us the rundown. Good morning, Dan Diane. Well, I have to say, I love the pink jacket on you this morning. <laughs> but getting back to Yum Brands, uh, revenue came in lower than expectations at $1.71 billion compared to estimates of $1.77 billion. Adjusted earnings per share came in higher, though. But Pizza Hut did drag sales lower, especially here in the U.S., where sales were flat. The CEO, David Gibbs, said on the call that it is a tough category as the company looks to lean into long-term strategy 
to build new entry points like individual meal occasions or products like melts as well as wings. But Taco Bell and KFC continue to drive strength for Yum! brands, both beating same-source sales estimates. KFC, as you can see here, grew sales by 6% as individuals and families look to those new innovation of hand-breaded chicken nuggets and boneless wings. He said that it is a growing category chicken. And Taco Bell saw sales, same-store sales grow 8% year-over-year, led by sales here in the U.S. Menu flexibility with new offerings in chicken as well, and pricing power helped drive consumers there, especially looking for value. Their other chain, I do want to note, Habit Burger Grill did see sales decline by 5%, but they also mentioned that unit growth in their uh, various brands did drive sales as well. But as far as consumer behavior, they said on the call that there are pressures, but their franchisees are certainly navigating them. They also said that Taco Bell is seeing income cohorts of all levels drive sales growth there as well. Brooke, I think it's always fascinating when we can hear a company put menu innovation or any type of innovation and chicken nuggets in the same sentence. Uh, so we'll see exactly where that continues to be the strategy for Yum! Brands. Brooke, stay with us. We've also got to talk about Kraft Heinz here this morning. The company, widely known for its ketchup and Kraft mac and cheese, reported its Q3 results. Despite missing Wall Street's revenue expectations shares, we're seeing them on the move after Kraft Heinz boosted its adjusted earnings per share outlook. Shares are up by about 1.6%. Brooke De Palma back with us to weigh in on the latest results. Brooke, want to get your main takeaways here. Yeah, Brad. Well, that boost from Wall Street is certainly due to the forecast full year, uh, forecasted full year adjusted profit in the range of 2.91 to 2.99 per share. That's compared to a previous range of 2.83 to 2.91. So that boosted adjusted full year profit certainly impressing Wall Street this morning. They did narrow their full year outlook in organic sales growth. Uh, it was four to six percent. They're now saying that it's going to be closer to the low end of the range of approximately 4%. But those price increases certainly did drive sales this quarter. We saw price increases of 7.1%. Those boosted adjusted margins to 34%. But volumes, the number of units sold by KFC, did feel some pressure during this quarter. They dropped by 5.9% in their North America business and dropped by 2.6% in their international business. The CFO just said on the call that at some point in 2024, they do expect volumes to turn positive and that call is still underway. And so we'll definitely wait to see what else Kraft, has, Kraft Heinz has to say about consumer behavior. But it's also important to note that other companies that we're taking a closer look at, like Coca-Cola, like Kraft Heinz, in addition to um, in addition to Kellogg's, as well as General Mills, also did take higher prices in the recent quarters. And so certainly it's interesting to watch how these consumer staples uh, push through this dynamic environment where customers are certainly looking for value options and promotions as well. All right, Brooke De Palma, thanks so much. We appreciate the deep dive on the food and beverage earnings. And sticking in that sector, they're making me say this, winner, winner, chicken dinner. Shares of Wingstop moving higher this morning after the company Smashed Wall Street expectations for the third quarter. Uh, it's higher, but you've seen it come down a little bit. Now, revenue came in at $117.1 million for the quarter, up 26% in the last year. The company lifted its full-year guidance on strong demand and expects to see same-store sales growth of just about 16% for the year, up from its prior guidance of 10 to 12%. Now, I have to say, I haven't gone to Wingstop, and I don't know how long, but... People are clearly going. Shame. I know, right? You don't say. Look, I mean, it, it, uh, it, it's clear that even though we're seeing a little bit of cooling in the share price, you saw sure. a pop in the pre-market, a little bit of cooling. They do have their earnings call coming up at 10 a.m., so investors will probably tune in for that. And, of course, it probably ties into the broader theme of the market just waiting to see what the Fed does in general. But Wingstop certainly did better than a lot of other peers in its space. People are going to buy their wings. People are going there, <laughs> clearly. Going. Yeah, if you are surprised or tickled to find out that Wingstop shares are actually outpacing the NASDAQ composite this year, 
You're not alone, as I was even taking a look at it this morning. Uh, color me surprised, too, here. Mm -hmm. And it really comes back to a, a few things here. Number one, they're opening more stores. The domestic same-store yep. sales increased 15.3%. Digital sales jumped 66.9%. And total revenue was up by about 26.4% there. So all in, as you mentioned, more people go in there for, wh whether it's the sandwich or the wings, more people have been shopping or at least increasing the order um, and the third quarter results, they say, showcase some of the strategies they're executing against. But it's really coming back to how much people are ordering as well yep. here. And I think it'd be right for investors to keep a close eye on the domestic average unit volume. This is that AUV figure that they also continue to put out the average annual sales of all restaurants that have been opening for basically a trailing 52 week period. So that's going to give you uh, some solid comps to look at going forward. Yeah. And of course, just, uh, you know, reiterating the confidence in how they're doing. I mean, look at this chicken on screen. <laughs> no, sorry. It looks better than I'm sorry. I'm going to give my personal opinion here. Uh -oh. Not a big fan of Wingstop. Um, it's the in my pictures, rankings. The pictures look great from what we just saw, but my experience has been a little different. Not the worst chicken wings I've ever had, but, you know, look, people clearly like it. Maybe they're dipping it in ranch and blue cheese. To, I've been a buyer you know, in multiple it. locations. I can say yes. that. Yes. Do you like it? I've been a purchaser at multiple locations. <laughs> no comment for the press, I've tried them. clearly. I, I try everything. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try all, yes. the, all the wings out there. The sandwiches. Look, uh, but again, their same store sales growth is good. More than 15% double digit same store sales growth domestically. They're doing really well. People are buying their chicken wings, investors buying their shares. We'll see how that earnings call uh, turns out today. And meantime, we've got more of your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Twenty twenty three rocked the markets. Nvidia, the stock has been on a tear. Silicon this Valley week. banks collapse is the second largest bank failure in the U.S. Inflation, mortgage rates, the diabetes drug, Ozempic. Now it's time to make bold decisions. Yahoo Finance Invest, the marquee event for investors seeking big ideas and bold decisions. Guided by the newsroom you trust. Don't miss it November 7th, exclusively on Yahoo Finance.
Welcome back. You're watching Yahoo Finance Live. We are live from the NASDAQ market site. The picket signs are down for now. The UAW has ended its six-week campaign of coordinated strikes after reaching tentative deals with the three big automakers in Detroit. Among other guarantees, workers will see higher pay and inclusion in the EV transition. But that transition has been costly for both Ford and GM have recently scaled back investments. In an effort to make EVs more attractive, car companies led by Tesla have cut prices significantly. The average EV price tag has fallen a staggering 22% from last year, according to Kelly Blue Book. So, what do higher labor costs and lower price tags mean for the Detroit three auto workers? Joining us now, we've got Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman to help us break this down a little bit more. Hey, Rick. Hey, guys. A lot of implications from the end of this strike, I think, Clearly a win for uh, the United Auto Workers and um, its members. Uh, so there are a lot of questions about what happens next. First of all, uh, this went pretty well for President Biden. Um, remember, he went to uh, he went up to Michigan and he walked a picket line and political analysts said, ooh, risky move for a president to take sides. Uh, well, Biden seemed to have taken the right side in this. Uh, and that's going to give him some credibility uh, during the election next year because those, you know, those states, Michigan and Wisconsin in particular, are swing states. And Biden can go there. And he said, look, I've been on the side of the unionized workers here for the start. From the start, I proved it by coming up when you guys were on strike and vote for me. He's got a pretty good case there. Um, now, we've got three Detroit automakers that are going to face higher costs. Uh, Ford estimated that this deal will add about $900 to the cost of producing a car in the United States with unionized labor. That is a lot. A $900 on the, uh, added to the cost of a car. I mean, automakers work like mad to trim the, the cost of a part by 25 cents. Um, so that actually puts the Detroit automakers at more of a cost disadvantage than they were before. However, the union thinks they have a pretty good shot at unionizing some of the other automakers uh, that are that do not currently employ unionized workers. Tesla is a big one out in California and down in Texas. Uh, there are many uh, foreign based automakers that have factories mostly in the south that are not unionized. Uh, the UAW has tried before without success to unionize a couple of those, but there's a new mood in the country about unions. Um, they are more popular than they have been in a long time. And, and probably some of the workers at those plants are saying to themselves, I would like to get paid what those uh, UAW members uh, in the upper Northwest working for the Detroit Three are going to get paid. So there is a lot more to come on this. Speaking of that, more to come, we've seen just this labor uprising in a variety of industries, Rick. And the UAW said they aim to target non-union auto plants in the U.S. Like, you, you know, you've talked about this. Companies like Toyota, Volks, Volkswagen, and Tesla. What can you tell us about unionization efforts uh, in, with regard to those and the targeting of those automakers? Uh, you know, the, uh, until this year... Uh, I mean, it seemed like um, unions really were were just in long term decline. Uh, they weren't popular and they were not likely to get any traction where I mean, look at what's been happening with Amazon, you know, workers trying to Amazon at union uh, at Amazon um, places of employment, mm -hmm. warehouses and stuff like that. I mean, some want to do it, but it's it's not like there's a groundswell of support to do it. That seems like it could be change, changing. And boy, one of the things that could end up being quite dramatic is if there is a, unionize, a serious unionization effort at Tesla. Um, Elon Musk is one of the most anti-union CEOs in America. Uh, and you have to wonder, what would Elon Musk do if <laughs> if the UAW tried to, tried to unionize his plant? Um, he is opening a plant, or he plans to open a new plant in Mexico and by the way, this is another possible unintended consequence of, you know, when American labor costs go up, a lot of automakers do have do have factories in Mexico where it is way cheaper to build stuff. And it would not be surprising if you saw more auto production going to Mexico, uh, you know, a nearby country uh, that is easy to ship stuff to and from. And could Tesla do that with some of the uh, the cars they build in the United States? I mean, we may be talking a couple of years down the road here, but I think some fascinating battles might be coming. Yeah, you're right. That would certainly be one to watch if Tesla would ever uh, be unionized. I mean, I, I, I agree with you. We certainly know that Elon Musk has been anti-union, so we'll see if that even could take off. Thank you so much, Rick Newman. Bye, I guys. Appreciate you.
Take it easy. All right, we've got more of your market action ahead, live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. They command multi-billion dollar empires and dominate the boardroom. I admit when I'm wrong. What you want to do is control your controllables. Decisions that impact your investments are made by them every single day. Profit and purpose go hand in hand. Now, Yahoo Finance grants you exclusive access to these titans of industry. Discover the motivations behind industry-altering decisions and the visionaries who imprint their legacy on the world's most renowned companies. Join us for our groundbreaking series, Lead This Way. Let's get into some market commentary of the day. TD Cohen initiating coverage of 13 stocks in the consumer finance sector, including credit card companies, subprime auto and student lenders, non-prime lenders and small business lenders. Now, among TD Cohen's top picks are Discover Financial Services, SLM Corp, that would be Sally May, and One Main Holdings. The analysts explain and note why these companies stand out, uh, writing, quote, each of these is somewhat out of consensus, which in the current environment has leaned towards low or tended towards rather lower risk lenders. We believe that ongoing healthy employment and seasoning of COVID vintages, end quote, will allow for or rather will allow for strong earnings in 2024 and beyond, end quote. I mean, one of the things that stood out to me about what T.D. Cohen says, particularly for Sally Mae, is that 
it dominates the private student loan business. Mm -hmm. So that one does make sense, especially now that we know that the student loan resumption of payment has returned. Um, Discover, to me, was a little bit of a head scratcher, uh, Discover Financial Services, but um, TD Cohen saying it's less bearish on credit quality, I suppose, when you think about it compared to consensus. Uh, because of the strong employment picture, which we've consistently talked about that. And I know we're going to be diving into some employment uh, data today when we look at ADP, when we look at JOLTS, and then by the end of the week, you know, you have the granddaddy jobs report coming. Right. Uh, so, but so again, so that's why initiating coverage in the credit card space, not just Discover, also um, AXP, American Express as well. So that's one of the things that stood out to me in terms of where they're initiating coverage and what the case is for these. Yeah, Discover is their top pick here, mm -hmm. given that it's the inherent benefit of lower acquisition costs, the company, or at least the analysts here pointing out here, continuing to demonstrate strong loan Loan growth, same time, believing current regulatory issues will eventually come to pass here as part of their thesis around that top pick of Discover. But you mentioned some of the kind of broader themes that they're noting here within this broader initiation of coverage here. And one of those things is going to be a, a larger debate that plays out in the sector here. And one of those is the competition and growth. Competition still relatively high in credit cards right now, less so in installment lending, but loan growth, they're saying, has been strong at card issuers due to the decline in payment rate and picked up over the last few quarters. So let's help make all of this make sense and contextualize this and why this is important, perhaps why they're initiating some of this coverage, too. As consumers right now are looking across their own household balance sheets, they're also realizing where they need to tap credit card or swipe credit card, tap, swipe, whatever we're doing these days, where they need to leverage that ability to purchase even more so. And that's where you get back into, on a household basis, where the overall debt that has been taken on because of credit cards has risen to levels uh, mm -hmm. that, that we have unseen before. So at this point in time, that's going to be where more of the analyst coverage continues to come forward, and um, perhaps we'll hear even more on these key names, especially that top pick, yeah. Discover, um, because that is often seen as one of the card services that plays into more of kind of the lower income end of the yeah. market, too. Yeah, possible low pri lower prime sector. I mean, and on the flip side, they have American Express on their list as yep. well, yep. and they say that key issues on uh, with regard to American Express will be ability to meet its rev guidance for the year and beyond, um, and then just also whether it can maintain just its unit economics for American Express, given its engagement costs. Uh, so that will be one to watch in that sector. One other thing I want to quickly jump into, they have Ally on their list, um, saying that Ally has done a strong job of pricing new auto loans. They do couch that with the fact that this uh, higher for longer rate environment um, could, you know, just put pressure on capital. Uh, so, and it could pressure their earnings estimates, their guidance uh, going forward. So we'll certainly uh, be watching that. Uh, we'll put a pin in that. We've got more of your market action ahead, live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Ripping and rolling here this morning. I'm Brad Smith alongside Diane King Hall at the NASDAQ market site in New York City. We're about 30 minutes into the start of today's trading activity. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up right now. Stocks, they are higher to start November amid a deluge of earnings out before and after the bell. Investors are also anticipating another hawkish pause from the Federal Reserve. Meantime, let's take a look at some individual names. Luxury goods companies are under some pressure today. Estee Lauder cut its fiscal 2024 outlook amid slowing growth in China. The company also cited possible risk to business in the Middle East as the war between Israel and Hamas continues with no ceasefire in sight. Estee Lauder saw sales drop 10% in its most recent quarter, driven by a plunge in skincare, which declined some 22%. And another... Re- <laughs> well. Another luxury company feeling the pain. Canada Goose? Wow, the luxury parka maker whose coats usually go for about a grand. Missed analyst expectations for revenue as growth in China faltered and North American revenue, that fell 7%. The company also cut its full year guidance for revenue and profit as consumers grow more cautious. Another company trimming its profit forecast, that would be Norwegian Cruise Lines. The company is feeling the pressure from rising fuel costs, which haven't been fully offset by higher ticket prices and resilient demand. Norwegian is also closely watching the potential impact of the ongoing Israel-Hamas war. We know the cruise liners had seen uh, benefit earlier in the year, but now we've seen some pullback. Well, we've got some breaking economic data that's come across this morning. We're tracking JOLTS, the Job Opening and Labor Turnover Survey for September 2023 here. And ultimately, the number of job openings has changed very little. And in fact, uh, not at all. 9.6 million on the last (laughs) business day of September. And then ultimately, with some of the other data and details that come into this, number of higher and total Mm -hmm. separations, little change there, 5.9 million and 5.5 million, respectively. And then within then separations, quits, um, 3.7 million, and then layoffs and discharges. You saw one and a half million. That also a very little change here. So all in yep. all, this continues to kind of lock in this trend that we've watched in hires and total separation rates continuing to drift lower here on the rate side of that. And just some of the context that we're seeing within this over the month, the total separations decreased in state and local government, mm-hmm. education, um, non-durable goods manufacturing, but increased in federal government where it was up by about 8,000 there. And that is on the total separations. Rate. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you nailed those numbers. And I, I mean, you're just seeing this pattern of, although it's it was once unchanged from the prior month, just uh, continuing to see some strength in terms of job openings. Yes, not at the peak of the year, but it shows that we still have a s- pretty sturdy job market. You take that also, though, I want to couch that in the context of we had a broader picture from ADP out today on private sector payroll showing that companies added 113,000 jobs last month. That was uh, weaker than expected. Um, the reading was for around 150 k um, when we're looking at uh, the Bloomberg survey for that. Now, the gains were across a variety of industries. Um, I know you like to do the sector by sector breakdown, Brad. I love sectors. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, we've seen gains in professional and business. Actually, I think they cut in this one. Um, but all regions of the country added jobs except the Midwest. Uh, so you saw strength largely across the country in terms of job gains, but cooling in terms of the number of jobs added. Yeah, and how does this pass through to the mindset of the consumer? And we we saw some of that come through in the consumer confidence data that came out just yesterday Mm -hmm. here where the conference board had noted that regarding the employment situation more broadly, slightly fewer consumers that that jobs were plentiful compared to September, but the numbers saying jobs were hard to get also declined. So all of that, and, and the reason why we bring this up, of course, is that the amount of jobs that are available and the ability for a a person who is part of the labor force to leave one job and then on the prospect of getting another job as well, that factors into the mindset of the consumer all in here too. Um, And then you mentioned some of the ADP figures Mm -hmm. that we've been tracking as well, where that was an overall add of about 113,000 in this most recent month. Right, exactly. Um, And one interesting note I just want to point out in terms of wages. Uh, So people who stayed in their jobs saw a median pay increase of 5.7% for ADP. But those who changed jobs, they saw their wages increase by 8.5%. 4%, both, though, slowest pace of wage increases since 2021. Absolutely. Well, 
Moving right along here, consumer staples have taken a hit this year as expectations of a global slowdown and hype around weight loss drugs push some investors to feel more pessimistic about the sector. Consumer giant Kraft Heinz reported results this morning, missing expectations for revenue but beating on profit. And while the catch-up maker saw a decline in volumes, the hit was mostly offset by price increases made in the quarter. Our next guest has Kraft Heinz on his list of top picks in the sector. Let's bring in John Baumgartner, who is the Mizuho Managing Director and Senior Consumer Equity Research Analyst. John, help us make sense of what we just saw come out from Kraft Heinz. Does this change how you run calculus around the expectations, the guidance, and, and ultimately your rating on the stock? Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Uh, it doesn't really change our outlook at all. Uh, you know, I think the street, you know, to your comments, has really revised lower expectations for sales growth for the food industry. You know, a lot of concerns out there around elasticity from historic price increases over the past, you know, one one and a half years. Uh, concerns for the GLP one weight loss drugs. Concerns for more private label purchasing in a tough macroeconomic environment. So, uh, expectations have been lowered for sales. So, even though there was a sales miss today. I think the profit upside is a net positive for the company going forward. And that's coming, you know, for as a result of cost savings coming through larger than expected, but also the company willing to trade unprofitable or less profitable volume for more profitable volume of which sold going forward. So really reinforces our thesis for this name, for this group really overall, that these shares are oversold and there is upside to numbers for Kraft Heinz through, let alone 2024, but 2025 relative to the street. John, uh, yesterday we saw some slowing in consumer confidence um, with the latest consumer confidence data out. Does that give you any cause for concern about where the consumer is when it comes to Kraft Heinz? You know, it, it really doesn't because looking at our quarterly consumer surveys, what we're really finding from consumers is the sentiment's actually a lot stronger than we would have thought. I mean, you're still seeing wage growth at double the rate of the 10-year average prior to COVID. Uh, you know, it seems that folks are not looking to trade down to private label. Uh, in general, they're happy with their branded food products as it is. Uh, so I think the the environment, at least for staples, maybe not for discretionary consumer, but for staples, we believe that the demand environment is much stronger than what's being priced into these stocks. And with Kraft Heinz, you're seeing a lot of new distribution, uh, international markets in U.S. food service, uh, things outside of the grocery store that we can't see as investors that are accretive to the company's growth, driving upside uh, you know, to what is in just the day-to-day -day grocery sales, new innovation coming through, Partnerships with outside companies, Microsoft, Google, looking at better ways to analyze uh, consumer preferences for innovation ideas, for better supply chain execution. So uh, we think that Kraft's in a very good position going forward. You talked about some of the, the international ambitions that this company has. Asia softness, you, you know, and a limited degree of snapback following the second quarter's headwinds in Brazil as well here. Where, what region does Kraft Heinz need to make sure that they continue to get right in order to meet some of the analyst expectations on the street? Well, it's predominantly Asia and Latin America. And I think what investors have to appreciate with Kraft is, you know, emerging markets are 10% of the company's net sales, but it's about one third of sales growth. So it is a big driver going forward. And what we're seeing from Kraft is increases in distribution, changes in the route to market, how they're distributing more efficiently, uh, you know, in terms of getting to that end consumer. So, you know, there will be, just given the sides of these markets and, you know, the balls they're juggling, you know, there will be quarter to quarter volatility in some of these prints. So, you know, we believe this is still a high single digit growth opportunity for the company on an annual basis going forward. There may be shifts from quarter to quarter when shipments hit, but end market demand overall seems relatively intact. And as I said, you know, innovation, distribution coming through, uh, you know, these are the two areas of the world, Asia and Latin, that are most important on the company's radar. John, do you have any concerns about volumes for Kraft Heinz at all based on its latest quarter? Not really. I think one of the things that we've seen from our consumer surveys is leftovers consumption uh, is hitting an all-time high, at least for the past 10 to 15 years. We're seeing about 45% of households eating more leftovers. Uh, and that alone, I think, is enough to get a drag of volumes being down mid to high single digit in some categories. What we've seen historically when it comes to leftovers and consumers pinching pennies, wasting less food, is that that sentiment tends to sort of uh, moderate over a six to nine month period. We're probably halfway through that leftover trend right now. So we think you should see consumers um, you know, economizing in other areas of their budget going forward as you're into the first quarter, you know, second quarter of next year. And for Kraft Heinz, you should see a sequential improvement. We're seeing more innovation, more merchandising, 
more seasonal promotions around the holidays, Thanksgiving and Christmas, uh, working with retailers to get more shelf sets in the store. So that should also improve their market share sequentially into 2024. John, we have rebranded leftovers, at least in, in my home, as meal prep. It just feels better when you say it that way. Um, ultimately, though, when you think about the margins going forward from here, where, where and what type of margin profile do you expect this company to carry? Where would you like to see them be able to get to? Well, I think, you know, part of the story is you're seeing about, you know, half a billion dollars of cost savings coming through on an annual basis from cost efficiencies. You assume half of that is reinvested back into the business, give or take for advertising, more marketing, improving these brands. The other half should flow through to the profit line. So from a margin perspective, looking at profit margin, we think, you know, 40 to 50 basis points of annual margin expansion going forward uh, is, is, is a pretty reasonable number. Uh, you know, some gross margin expansion, some efficiencies from the operating expenditures on the SG&A line, but all in about 40 to 50 basis points of annual margin expansion uh, you know, is reasonable, you know, assuming the top line can grow yeah, two to three percent. And John, what's, what are the risks that you see to the price target you have on the stock? I think the risk to the price target would would primarily be an incremental erosion in developing markets. You know, just you know weaker macros, more geopolitical risks there. Uh, you know, higher inflation that causes tighter spending for some of these categories going forward. Uh, I think, you know, the, the U.S. consumer, again, feels to be in a pretty good place. So we're not that concerned over North America, whether it's private label or absolute spending. The, the, the marginal risk is probably coming from international, you know, Europe, LATAM, you know, Asia. You know, see incremental softness there that lowers growth expectations in 2024. All right, John Baumgartner, Mizuho Managing Director and Senior Consumer Equity Research Analyst. John, thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you. You got it. We're watching shares of CVS this morning, continuing to watch it after the company saw sales rise almost 11 percent from last year, boosted by cost cutting efforts last quarter, but slashed its full year unadjusted uh, earnings forecast. So we're seeing some pressure on the stock. Trouble could be on the horizon for the healthcare giant as it faces a nationwide walkout stage by employees over working conditions, which they say are putting customers at risk. Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kimlani joins us now with her top takeaways. Anj? That's right, Dan. So we know that, of course, the the uh, walkouts, the protests, the strikes, those are really putting pressure on the company, you know, not just a CVS, but also other pharmacies. And what's underpinning that is, of course, the increased amount of work that these uh, these pharmacists have to do with increased vaccine. We know that the retail sector has been largely depended on for that. So that has been part of the problem. Meanwhile, you know, CVS isn't doing so bad by comparison. They do have strength in their healthcare services. That is a key part of why they were able to beat expectations. Uh, their push into home care services, healthcare services, the acquisition of Oak Street and Signify being a part of that have been a part of this story of why the company continues to have a strong showing a quarter over quarter, in part because this is a new avenue for them. They're, they're sort of uh, uh, competing in a different space. They are able to add to the services that they provide, in addition to uh, moving away from the dependence on prescriptions and food in front of store. That has been a story for you know pharmacies, broadly speaking, that has shown a lot of volatility. It's a little bit softer some some parts of the year. So they've been able to sort of diversify what they're looking at. And that is sort of the, the CVS story. Now, they do have the pressure from the pharmacists who are walking out. And we'll see what that does really for Q4, because that story is only just beginning. Anjali, what do see, uh, CVS's earnings signal for competitors like Walgreens and Rite Aid? Right. So, of course, they're also facing the same pressures, you know, with the uh, walkouts, with the strikes. But their story is a little bit different. They're not quite as diversified or they're only starting their diversification journey, that vertical integration. Uh, we saw, of course, the new hire for the CEO spot at Walgreens, Tim Wentworth, big insurance background, big healthcare background. What does that mean for the company? And Rite Aid, on the other hand, filing for bankruptcy. So you can see how much that reliance on retail hasn't necessarily been the right strategy by comparison to CVS's strength. So uh, it really is incumbent on them to sort of match what they're doing and how they can bring together all these parts. You see on your screen, healthcare benefits, that's the 
that's the insurance part and that's where some of the strength lies so having that full circle portfolio is what you see a lot of companies trying to pursue and that's part of the sort of retail health story that we've been watching and i know i know you know you and i've talked about it so that's sort of what we need to keep an eye on uh, to see how this story moves forward. Do uh, Does that acquisition of Oak Street Health and Signify get justified? A lot of analysts have said, or, or you know, some have said that it could have been too high of a premium that the company paid. So we're still watching that story and how it all pans out. Yeah, certainly in focus for analysts there. Anjali Kamalani, Yahoo Finance Zone, helping us break down these stories, especially around the PBMs and, well, specifically CVS here today. <laughs> Thanks so much here, Anjali. Appreciate it. All your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. They command multi-billion dollar empires and dominate the boardroom. I admit when I'm wrong. What you want to do is control your controllables. Decisions that impact your investments are made by them every single day. Profit and purpose go hand in hand. Now, Yahoo Finance grants you exclusive access to these titans of industry. Discover the motivations behind industry altering decisions and the visionaries who imprint their legacy on the world's most renowned companies. Join us for our groundbreaking series, Lead This Way. The United Kingdom is playing host to a two-day AI summit starting today, where global leaders and the biggest names in tech are assembling to discuss AI regulation and safety. And while the UK is using this summit to station itself as a global leader in the AI space, 
it does follow suit with global leaders scrutinizing regulations of the emerging tech. President Biden issued an executive order earlier this week, for instance. So let's bring in C3 AI chairman and CEO Tom Siebel to discuss more about what's happening in the AI space here. Tom, great to have you on with us. First and foremost, let's talk about the executive order that we saw come from President Biden saying that it's taking some of the most sweeping actions to protect Americans from the potential risks of AI systems. From the CEO and, and chairman's perspective of an AI company, how do you translate that? Uh, this is it, <clears throat> this is really a very broad-reaching order, okay, from the White House, uh, as it relates, and it, it elevates AI to the top of the agenda by the order of the president for the Secretary of State, the Secretary of, the Def of Treasury, Defense, Attorney General, Agriculture, Commerce, Labor, Health and Human Services, you name it. So now it, uh, AI has clearly been put to the top of the agenda of each of these agencies and each of these departments. They are given between 90 days and in some cases 240 days to you know, establish a chief AI officer, okay, study the risks and benefits of AI to the United States government, the Department of Defense, the Intelligence Department, the, you know, the, the medical community to see how could we use these technologies to the benefit of the American people. Uh, what are the risks of these technologies and how can we mitigate those risks? And importantly, how can we partner with the private sector uh, and the academy uh, to uh, establish the United States as a clear leader globally uh, in artificial intelligence. It's it's a very 63 pages of very thoughtful substance. So do you think that um, the government, I mean, one of the concerns has been about protecting people's privacy. Um, and, and that is one of the things that was mentioned in terms of the White House order, um, prioritizing federal support for accelerating the development and use of privacy, uh, preserving techniques. So where does C3AI stand on how much privacy protection is built into what you all do? No, I think that you know the privacy protection and the right to be forgotten is an absolute mandate. Uh, a privacy protection... Uh, the prevention of using AI to, to uh, propagate uh, social and cultural bias. Uh, these are absolute mandates of the executive order, and we are all for it. When you see sweeping discussion, sweeping regulation come forward, and, and there have been many of those conversations where executives like yourselves have, have been able to weigh in on and, and give administrations around the world and world leaders some type of inclination as to where they need to learn more, what they need to know about artificial intelligence, which has been around for decades. It's really just generative AI that's reinvigorated so much of the conversation now here, too. So with that in mind, is, is there anything within these discussions that you hear taking place that says that C3 AI, your company, would have a materially different market that you can address or even that your financials would be different if executives, at least in the political realm, did not get regulation correct? Well, I think that this is not so much about regulating this executive order. It's about understanding the technology, understanding the benefits of these technologies of AI, how we can take advantage of the benefits, understanding the risks, how we can mitigate mitigate and avoid the risks. So I don't see this as a big piece of regulation. It, it, it's an order to the people who run the United States government, okay, be it Intel, be it defense, be it health and human services, transportation, labor, you name it. And this is an order to understand these technologies, okay, get and get a report on my desk as the president. Okay, I want a report within 90 to 240 days on how you're going to take advantage of these technologies to the, to the advantage of the American people and to the United States of America. It's an important document. And Tom, um, one of the things that you uh, briefly touched on earlier that came up in the order was the issue of uh, potential bias within AI and civil rights. Um, where do you stand on how AI can address that issue for algorithmic discrimination um, and fairness when it comes to, say, the functionality of AI within uh, the legal system? 
Uh, anytime we look at the intersection of AI and sociology, you know, the potential for propagating a cultural and social bias is very high. We will perpetuate these bi uh, the, uh, this bias. So we need to be very careful to understand it, understand what the source of bias is, and either either mitigate it or avoid the use of AI will we'll be will be propagating bias. And the executive order is is very clear on that. And uh, so I think the the government is providing leadership on what is a very important issue. I think, you know, equally important is privacy, you know, the right to be forgotten. OK, the right that to, to protect our, our personally identifiable information. I mean, we're going unless unless these are properly deal dealt with, you know, we're going to a very scary place. And but I think the um, you know, the leadership of the White House and the government on this is very clear. And it's been made, made very clear by the White House that if you if you work for the United States government, that AI is your top priority understand it, figure out how to take advantage of it, okay, embrace with the private sector and, and, and the academy and get it done and get the report on my desk and tell me how you're going to do it. So it's 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 an it's a, it's a important uh, demonstration of leadership, and I think it will have a, I mean, we have a White House AI Council formed we now that consists of, you know, the secretary of virtually every agency. We have every agency now has to, you know, put in place a chief AI officer. This is, it's very clear. Artificial intelligence is now a top priority of every department of the United States government. Tom, what is your reaction when you hear of executives and especially world-renowned executives like that of Elon Musk saying that artificial intelligence could lead to humanity's extinction? Um, you know, I think it's a little bit, uh, you know, there's a little bit of showmanship going on there. Is AI important? AI is hugely important. Okay. Is this a, uh, this is, this is, is it as important as the development of electricity? Potentially. And, you know, this is a very big deal. Uh, the, you know, I think the consequences of this, we don't need to worry about so much about the the sentient computer about our smart refrigerator taking over our house I, I think the consequences are you know much more real and they're much more they're they're these are not decades away this is today this says you know look how AI is used in social media for you know in privacy issues um, uh, public health issues uh, look at all the people in the United States and Europe, particularly young women, suffering from you know, depression, body image issues, uh, uh, suicidal tendencies. So this is scary stuff. It's a direct result of AI, and, and it's happening now. It's not something happening 30 years in the future. So I, I'd worry a little bit more about what's happening today than what you know might happen some decades down the road. All right. Well, we're certainly at the frontier of the, these all these developments within the AI space. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Tom Siebel, C3 AI, Chairman and CEO. All right, stocks are kicking off November with a rebound this morning, coming off a third straight losing month. Investors are still waiting on the Federal Reserve's interest rate decision that is out later today. Though it's all but certain rates will remain unchanged. Investors are eager for any indication of the path forward for monetary policy. We want to bring back in Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery to give us some insight on what we might expect this month. Jared? Thank you, Diane. Uh, nobody has a crystal ball here, but we do have historical tendencies, and maybe we can guess what the tailwinds or headwinds might be in the month of November. What I'm looking at here, I've showed this several times over the last month, this is the S&P 500 performance by month. September, which is this purple line, which has trended down since 1960, that's, that is done. This other line right here, that's October, the cyan line, that is done. Now we are looking at orange, that is November. And since 1960, of the last four months of the year, this has been the most bullish. And then December, I would note, tends to be bullish as well. Now, of course, uh, we do have to worry about exogenous factors. We have tr huge treasury supply coming online. We have a Federal Reserve that's still reacting to surging inflation, although it has been ameliorating. So these things can override seasonality. But nevertheless, historical tendencies tend to take place uh, when the market has just kind of uh, already made its move and is trying to find its footing. And that's where we are right now. So as long as Treasury yields, 10-year, does not surge above 5%, I think we have a decent shot 
at, uh, at rallying into the end of the year. Now, um, I want to make a remark on this chart right here. First of all, this is the S&P 500 performance. Uh, that is a purple line over the month of November. You can see uh, it tends to uh, surge in a little bit, excuse me, in the early beginnings, then it tails off of a bit and it surges at the end. Now this cyan line right down here, this is also the S&P 500, but that represents the third year of the US presidential cycle. So a little bit more relevant to the time period in which we are, you can tell it actually trades sideways. It dips into the middle of the month and then it accelerates towards the end. And I do have a, a comment. This is uh, by Almanac Trader. This is Jeff Hirsch uh, writing over there. On the first trading day of November, so that's today, is the fifth best of all monthly first trading days since September of 1997. And uh, that is based on the Dow and its points gains. Uh, the Dow, S&P 500, and NASDAQ have all advanced 13 times over the last 21 years. But uh, it gets a little bit better. Following a bearish streak from 2005 to 2011, all three indices have been up eight of the last 11 years. So uh, not surprising, I guess, that we are uh, looking at an update today in the markets. Now, I also want to take another look at seasonality via the VIX. The VIX tends to trade inversely with the stock market. So when it goes up, that's times of fear. That's when we see st uh, stocks sell off. And what we see here, this purple line is where we have been this year. The cyan line is a historical average. And we've actually traced this out pretty closely this year. We got a peak towards the end of October. That was that slowdown in equities. That was that drop in equities. Uh, Seasonality-wise, I would have expected that a little bit earlier, but nevertheless, we got it here. And if history uh, is any guide, well, we should drift lower in the VIX towards the end of the year. What does that mean for stocks? It means that stocks should have a bullish tilt into the end of the year, guys. All right, Jared Blickery, all the data that we need going into the final two months of the year here. Jared, appreciate it. All your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market side. We've got much more left here. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance. XBO has seen a blockbuster year so far in 2023. The stock pushing higher by over 120% year to date. The freight transportation company got a big boost in the third quarter with its shipments per day jumping 5% from the second quarter due in part to Yellow's bankruptcy and that filing that came back in August. For more on the state of the shipping industry, we're joined by XBO CEO Mario Herrick. 
Mario, great to have you here with us as always. First and foremost, you talked in this most recent quarter and, and the release about some of the pricing initiatives that you're set to roll out. Where can investors expect that to show up in some of the financial performance for the company? First, uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, well, uh, rather, you look at the improvements we have done on our service product. They've been tremendous. And in our industry, when you provide great service for, you, for your customers, that over time leads to pricing increases and pricing gains as well. So we had great performance in pricing in the third quarter, where it was up 6.4% on a year-on-year -year basis. And we do expect that to accelerate in the fourth quarter to be up high single digit. But this is X fuel, so this is just the base underlying pricing in our industry. And Mario, let's uh, broaden this out internationally. Where are you all with divesting your European business? Well, long term, uh, Diane, our goal is to be a pure play a North American LTL company. Uh, but and meanwhile, our European business is performing really well. Uh, you look, despite a very soft European economy, uh, we are improving our profits in our European business. We're providing great service for customers. We're managing costs very effectively. So the business is firing on all cylinders. Uh, but we long term, uh, we continue uh, to, to want to be a pure play North American FTL company. And in that North American less than truckload business on a year over year basis, shipments per day increasing by about 7.8 percent, tonnage per day also up by about 3.1 percent. Where are you seeing a lot of that demand flow in from? So it's, it's been a combination. So today, two thirds of our customers are industrial companies and one third are retail companies. And when we look at the increase on a quarter over quarter basis, and we were up 8% in shipment count on a year on year basis, we've seen it increase in each one of our channels. But there's a specific segment uh, that is higher on increases than others. And these are local accounts. These are small uh, mom and pop companies uh, where so far this year we've added more than 3,000 new customers. And we've seen a double digit increase, 13% increase in shipment count from those smaller accounts based on us gaining market share with the service improvements we're making. And Mario, uh, we know that you all were a beneficiary of what occurred with regard to the bankruptcy for Yellow. How do you continue to scale beyond the benefit that that gave you all as a company? Yeah, so Diane, if you go back to the first half of the year, uh, we had already been gaining market share. So the, the, the state of freight, the freight markets have been soft so far this year, but in our industry, if you look at the first half, shipments across the industry were down 10%. But even before the yellow bankruptcy, our shipment count was up 2% on a year on year basis in the second quarter. And that was driven by the improvements and service that we're doing to our customers. And they were giving us a bigger market share and we were gaining profitable market share based on these improvements for our customers. How, how is this company also, for, for XPO, navigating some of the pressures that we've seen emerge in the fluctuations in fuel prices even? That's always going to be, of course, a concern in any logistics business. But how has that kind of been an outstanding kind of or perhaps an outlier uh, expense that you've had to consider as well here? Yeah, so when you look at the, the LTL industry, we have a mechanism to charge the fuel surcharge back to customers. So usually it's a, uh, it's a part of the service that we offer where on a weekly basis, we reset the fuel surcharge, we charge a customer based on the fluctuation up or down of the fuel expenses. So it's fairly normalized and customers do understand as part of the, of the, of the, the doing business in LTL. Uh, so it's a fairly, uh, it's a, it goes straight to the customer and the billing process based on that surcharge program. And Mario, I want to ask you just really quickly, um, you all have been firing on all cylinders. Uh, what are you doing to prepare for the potential um, of a recession? So, so we look at it from two perspectives. One is as an industry, and especially in the transport sector, the LTL industry can weather a recession very well. And the reason why is that historically, you, you didn't have enough capacity in the less than truckload industry to meet the demand. So even in a recessionary environment, you still see pricing go up on a year-on-year -year basis, and that helps in a, in a downturn type environment. The second part of this is all the company specific initiatives that we are driving, Diane. And when you look at it, from one perspective, we are focused on labor efficiency, insourcing third-party line haul, where we are adding more people and deploying our own folks to move more of our freight, to pricing initiatives, to market share gains, and importantly, tremendous service improvements that are enabling our customers to move a bigger 
part of their freight to XBO because they know we're going to take care of them. All right, Mario, congratulations on a strong quarter. I also saw this, uh, another congratulatory note. You all got named a top company for women to work for in transportation. Nice a feather in the cap there. All right, our thanks to XPO CEO Mario Herrick. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. We've got more of your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. We are live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City. Well, beverage company Vitacoco raised its full year sales guidance after beating profit estimates for the third quarter. The company, which mainly sells coconut water, saw revenue came in slightly lower than expected, though it beat on earnings per share. Its titular coconut water brand continued to be the largest contributor to the company's growth with the 8 percent net sales growth year over year. The company benefited during the quarter from a combination of higher pricing and lower transportation costs. Michael Kerbin, the Vita Coco Company co-founder and executive chairman, joins us now. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, Michael. We had a big chat about your company and your products this morning um, offline. So one of the questions I want to ask you getting into this, if you can't tell, I'm actually a fan, um, is this trend with regard to the obesity drugs and the GLP-1s, um, have you seen any kind of benefit in terms of uh, your sales volumes from that? Yeah, I mean, sales have continued to grow. Um, you know, net sales are up 15% uh, year to date through Q3. And we think that growth is attributable to many things. Yes, people are changing their diets. People are eating and drinking healthier. 
Um, people are looking for functional, healthy beverages, um, but also the many usage occasions for coconut water, whether it's in a smoothie in the morning or at the breakfast table, or when you get out of the gym in the middle of the day, all the way through to mixing with your cocktail in the evening for a healthier cocktail through to the hangover cure the next day. So all of these usage occasions, we believe are what are really driving the growth of the brand and the growth of the category today. Talk to us about some of the scaling that the company is doing as well in tandem with that and trying to reach out to more taste buds out there, Michael. Yeah, I mean, you know, Vita Coco today is one of the fastest growing beverages in the beverage aisle. Um, the category itself is the fastest growing category in beverage. Coconut water is growing faster than sparkling water, than sport drinks, even than the energy drink category. And Vita Coco is leading that growth. Um, you know, and we think we're bringing in a lot of new consumers. Like I mentioned, all the different usage occasions, but also coconut water is appealing to um, many different demographics. Um, you know, today, more than half of our consumers are non-white. Um, our brand and our category is over-indexed significantly with Hispanic and Asian shoppers, which are some of the fastest growing demographics uh, in the country. Um, and I, I want to ask you, Michael, then in, in terms of the, you said the company was growing already without the GLP ones. Are you um, kind of expecting to see an increase in terms of demand for your products as a result of where the expectations are for those drugs? Yeah, I think again, um, you know, people that are looking for healthier products and that are changing, um, you know, their diets and everything else, I think we play an important role. I think, you know, as you look at across the beverage aisle, um, one of the reasons that this category is growing so fast is because of the change in, in, in consumer dynamics and in, in the way consumers are looking at products and what they're eating today. I think it's remarkable to look at this, this stock price performance over the past year, up 173%. I mean, there's a lot to kind of rest your laurels on there, Michael, as you think about even further where investors want to see more growth that you've discussed, where they want to see more of the people who have not kind of welcomed the, and I, I will be fully transparent with you, there are some out there that coconut water just isn't their jam. I'm trying to come around. I'm trying my best. I mean, my first experience was... I've tried to was, convince him. She did. Uh, <laughs> yeah, one of my first experiences was after a holiday party. Somebody came and slammed a Vita Coco on my desk um, for one reason or another. But all these things considered, what do you think investors want to see from this business and in, in adding on to this shareholder appreciation and the value appreciation that's taken place over the past year? Yeah. Thanks. No, I think the performance has been good. We are, you know, the seventh best performing stock, seventh best performing IPO since 2021 in the entire stock market. We're the second best performing consumer IPO since 2021. Um, and so the stock has done well. But what's really interesting, I think that investors really like about the business and the model is we're growing incredibly fast. The growth is continuing and the opportunity to make coconut water a household staple is being, you know, people are seeing it and it's really coming to fruition. But we're doing all of that profitably. We've grown adjusted EBITDA from $20 million in 2022 to $60 million through Q3 of 2023 of this year. So we're able to grow profitably while generating significant cash. Um, so we've got all of the, the, the right economics, I think, for a good performing um, stock. And we think that will, we believe that that will continue well into the future with branded Vitacoco growth, continuing to grow the category, and also continuing to grow within healthy beverages as we look at other opportunities um, within the healthy beverage market. Does that mean an acquisition in the future, Michael? You talked about this a little bit on the earnings call about some of those new opportunities, potentially an acquire of complementary, uh, complementary beverage brands. Yeah, I mean, you know, we believe that this business has the foundation to be a large healthy beverage platform. Um, we're generating a lot of cash, um, and we think that over time, M&A should play a role in our growth. Um, you know, we think that as we're looking at different opportunities, we're looking at M&A opportunities um, throughout beverage, things that we can add significant um, growth to and leverage our foundation that we've built to really make these businesses better and stronger and more profitable. So we believe M&A right, will- we let you go. Thank you. Yes, I'm sorry. Finish your thought. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. 
Oh, okay, I was, I was just going to ask you, what is it? Is it coffee? Is it, is it soft drinks? You got to give us some type of some type of hint, just a little hint. Shelf stable, healthy, functional beverages would probably be the the best fit for us. All right, love to hear it, Michael Kerbin. We got to have you back once that acquisition is announced for sure. It sounds like you're doing a lot of pondering internally about it. Vita Coco Company co-founder and executive chairman joining us here today. Thanks so much. We appreciate the time. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Definitely. All your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Twenty twenty three rocked the markets. Nvidia, the stock has been on a tear. Silicon this Valley year. banks collapse is the second largest bank failure in the U S. Inflation, mortgage rates, the diabetes drug, Ozempic. Now it's time to make bold decisions. Yahoo Finance Invest, the marquee event for investors seeking big ideas and bold decisions. Guided by the newsroom you trust. Don't miss it November 7th, exclusively on Yahoo Finance. The future of work. The artificial intelligence boom is expected to spark a major shift in white collar work over the next decade, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, known in your hood as the BLS, <laughs> by 2032. One out of six new workers will be a home health or personal care aide. Nurses and counselors will keep the labor market strong despite the looming AI job apocalypse that's been discussed. As for the occupations that won't be safe from AI, it's anticipated that sales workers and farmers are at risk of being replaced here. A yeah. lot of data to break down and mull over from the BLS here. Yeah, from the BLS, there was also recent data from the World Economic Forum mm -hmm. about potentially expo potential exposure, what jobs are at risk when we think about this boom in AI. I mean, we've had this conversation today, especially given what we talked about recently with regard to the Biden administration, and then you have international order happening over in the UK with regard to how do you enforce and regulate AI in terms of uh, jobs that suffer from potential exposure at risk, 
risk due to AI, jobs like for automation, when we're thinking like clerical jobs, administrative jobs, database jobs, um, you know, things like that. There's also, there are jobs, uh, you know, we're looking at admin support right now, production, sales, farmers, that's from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The World Economic Forum has some similar um, demographics showing exposure. There is the potential for some jobs that would just have augmentation, right? That's right. what the World Economic Forum points out, that it doesn't necessarily mean those jobs will go away, but they'll be augmented by some form of AI. And really, right now, we're talking about generative AI, Brad. Yeah, and based on a Gallup poll that was done and, and released earlier this year, actually just uh, before we started the fourth quarter here, about one in five Americans, 19% roughly, believe AI will not affect the number of jobs, but 6% say it's going to result in an increase in jobs. However, that means that there are about 75% saying it's going to decrease the total number of jobs over the next 10 years. But it could mean that, again, once you have new technological innovation, that it could change the realm or the type of jobs that are out there. And that's something that is always a constant, as we I were talking about during the break. We're a little so. safe, though, because who's going to bring the personality? Let's do a quick check of markets before we let you go. We're looking at stocks higher uh, for the day as we kick off a new month. You're looking at the Dow, S&P 500, and NASDAQ all on the plus side right now ahead of the Fed decision. That is all from us today. You've got Akiko Fujita and Rochelle Akufo for the next hour. Stay with Dow Finance. Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. It is 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Akiko Fujita along with Rochelle Akufo. Here's what we're watching at this hour. Fed in focus. Investors eagerly await signals from the FOMC on future policy. The Treasury this morning seemingly responding to those higher rates, outlining plans to size step up the size of future bond sales. And not so magnificent October. The so-called magnificent seven stocks have led the market so far in 2023, but October provided a divergence of fortunes for the tech giants. We'll break down which broader themes are leading this change. And beauty bust. Estee Lauder share sliding as weakening China sales weigh on investor sentiment. The company also cutting its full year guidance, warning of more trouble ahead. 
Well, first, let's take a look at how the markets are faring an hour and a half into the trading day. Looking at green across the board here, all three in positive territory. We're seeing the Dow currently up just about 0.6% on the day. Also taking a look at the S&P 500, they're up about 0.7% or about 30 points there. We're seeing tech leading the S&P, materials and consumer staples, the laggard so far. And of course, tech-heavy Nasdaq, they're the strongest gainer this morning, up 106 points or 0.8% as we await all the information that we expect to hear from Fed Chair Jay Powell. And speaking of that, let's check in on the Treasury market action that we're seeing this morning. We know the 10-year yield has been trading in a narrower range for the past two weeks. That could all change depending on what we hear from Powell this, this afternoon. We're looking at the five-year currently down about 2% on the day. The 10-year also down about in that same range, about 1.9%. Longer term, also off that five mark that we saw, currently down about 1.5% so far this morning. Well, happy Fed Day to all who celebrate. Chair Jay Powell is taking the stage to give the committee's latest interest rate decision at 2 p.m. Eastern. Joining us now is our very own Jennifer Schonberger. So, Jennifer, what do you expect from today's decision? And happy Fed Day to you. It's great to be with you guys. Uh, like many others, I expect the Fed is going to hold rates steady in the range of five and a quarter to five and a half percent. And I expect Chair Powell to echo comments that he made back on October 19th ahead of this meeting, which is that the Fed is going to continue to proceed cautiously here. Uh, they have been on the most aggressive rate hiking campaign since the late 1980s. Uh, there's still more bite left in this lag per Powell, but he also thinks that inflation is still too high. And he added the caveat that if the economy continues to outperform, the job market continues to outperform, then the Fed could, could, using his language, uh, enact further rate hikes. Jen, you know, you talk about the uh, economy continuing to remain resilient. One of the areas we've really focused on is the consumer. And, you know, when you think about where consumers have been resilient, they're continuing to spend. There's been questions about why that Fed policy hasn't necessarily trickled down, impacting the consumer. I mean, how do you think the Fed sees that specifically, just given where rates have been? Yeah, Akiko, this is a very interesting rate hiking cycle, right? It's not been uh, the traditional impact that we've seen historically. And I think a big reason for that is that so many Americans, 80% of Americans are sitting on low fixed rate mortgages right now. And so that's allowing them much more spending power. Uh, they've got strong jobs, they've got strong wage growth. On the uh, corporate side, you're seeing a lot of corporations that have issued uh, fixed rate debt at low rates. And so they are sitting on strong cash cushions. So there's reason to believe that people can continue to spend and that the economy could continue to outperform. Of course, where perhaps the economy is feeling it is small businesses, which do create the majority of jobs in this country. They are feeling the brunt of these higher interest rates. But still, you know, it seems like there are large swaths of this economy that seem immune to these interest rate hikes. You know, you really would have thought that a year since the 75 basis point rate hike, the last 75 basis point rate hike that the Fed did, that we would be seeing the bite from that. And yet, we're seeing nearly 5% GDP growth. So then with that in mind, Jennifer, then, if we, if we look at some of the other factors that are essentially doing the Fed's work for it, you look at the rise in longer-term borrowing costs, tighter financial conditions there in the background, how much of that do you think we'll expect to hear? Yeah, I mean, I think that's going to factor in uh, as a major part of the discussions uh, behind closed doors and will be a big part of the questioning this afternoon. I think it's a question of sustainability, right? You guys were talking about the yield on the 10-year Treasury, and that's really come off uh, the highs that we saw of uh, 5%. And so if the yield on the 10-year Treasury is not sustained, then the Treasury market's not going to be doing the Fed's work for it. And if the economy remains resilient, the Fed's going to have to step back in. I mean, I think a question I have for Fed Chair Powell is how long and how high do they want to keep and see real rates at this level, right? Rates adjusted for inflation. Uh, that's sitting, it was as high as 2.8% um, uh, when we were at about 5% on the on the tenure. And so how restrictive and how long do they want that? We heard from Fed Chair Bell back in July that the Fed's got to begin cutting before they get to 2%. Otherwise, they really risk 
pushing this economy into a deep recession. Okay, Jen Schomberger joining us on a very busy day. Uh, we will, of course, have all live coverage on that Fed decision set to come down at 2 p.m. Eastern this afternoon. Thanks. Well, all three major averages closed October lower, resulting in a three-month losing streak. Stocks are now kicking off November in the green. Historically, stocks have ended the month on a high note. So can investors count on a bullish November? Let's bring in Omar Aguilar, Schwab Asset Management CEO, and CIO. Omar, we're going to get into uh, stocks in just a bit, but let's sort of dovetail on what uh, Jen was just talking about, because we are awaiting that Fed decision this afternoon. Um, in many ways, bond yields certainly have become the focus here because they have guided the Fed along, at least in this next step. Uh, how are you viewing the moves, particularly on the 10-year, and can these levels be sustained? Well, you know, it's it's we've been discussing this with clients and internally here that, you know, for the last 18 months, you know, the bond market has actually been the driver of most of what's going on in equities, as well as what's going on in just parts of the economy. Um, you know, the, the lift that we have seen in yields and the volatility of yields is unprecedented. Just, just the moves today where you actually see that yields just drop, you know, by 15, 20 basis points in a single day, you know, those are by historical standards pretty, pretty high. I think, you know, the the uh, the biggest part of this obviously has to do with, you know, where the, the end rate decision will be by the Fed. And while the market seems to be comfortable thinking about that there will be a pause today, you know, there seems to be a disconnect between Fed expectations or what they think they want to do based on their dot plot and what the market seems to be thinking. And they're still in this disconnect that creates this amount of volatility for bond yields. And as well as, you know, that translates into volatility to equity market. So with that in mind, then, you note that higher bond yields, a resilient job market and then slower wage growth, giving the Fed several options on the table. As we're coming off this three-month losing streak uh, for stocks, then how what does that signal then for November? What should investors expect? Well, you know, it, it's a great question. You know, on one hand, you know, the you know the Fed uh, seems to be in like this Goldilocks scenario where things are just working as they they cannot be better. I think if you think about the job that they have done, you know, while inflation is still uncomfortably high for their expectations and their comfort level of getting to that 2% in the near term seems to be a little farther away, you know, the economy continues to grow. The consumer continues to be very, very resilient. They see that the labor market is not necessarily weak enough for them, but it's in a pretty good shape. And the equity market, you know, yes, with a small breath, you know, we can see that it's still holding up pretty well. So when you put all this perspective, you know, the expectation for the remaining of the year is that as long as the economy and the labor market and the consumers stay resilient, then, you know, we will probably see a little more stability as the Fed gets closer to the end of their tightening cycle. I think earlier when you were discussing, you know, yes, the, the, the level of yields and the quantitative tightening by the Fed and other central banks, in a way, they're doing the job of actually creating that more restricted monetary policy. And, and therefore, as much as long as that gets a little more stable, we can actually see uh, equity markets and risky assets be a little less volatile. Uh, Omar, let's talk specifics in terms of strategy. You specifically highlight mm -hmm. uh, strong balance sheets and healthy profit margins as key in terms of names you're looking at. We're right in the thick of things in earnings. Who's impressed you so far? Well, you know, it's 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 clearly this is the area where we tend to uh, advise clients not to be heroes. Uh, you know, in this particular case, there's still a lot of uncertainty or where things are. You know, so far the discussion about an economic recession seems to be far away. Um, not everybody's talking about recession anymore, but you know, we're still not out of the woodwork. You know, we still have a tightening, you know, mechanism, lower liquidity, higher volatility, and while we have been on the camp that parts of the economy are already in recovery mode, we expect expect that we're still going to see significant amount of potential, um, you know, risk on the markets. And therefore, you know, as, as you described, we continue to emphasize quality both on equities and fixed income, you know, higher quality, um, uh, meaning, you know, companies with strong, you know, balance sheets, companies that tend to have, you know, good profit margins, tend to have good earnings revisions, and companies that tend to have, in general, you know, good earnings growth, and again, that tend to actually end up being more paying dividends as opposed to actually, you know, trying to, you know, take a big multiple. So that's a big part of, of what we focus on both equities and fixed income, as we believe we're still going to have some levels of volatility.
liquidity and lower liquidity going forward. We'll certainly be tracking all of that. Always great to have you on, Omar Aguilar Schwab, Asset Management CEO and CIO. Thanks so much. Well, we got a much anticipated announcement from the Treasury this morning. The department said it will increase the size of its bond auctions in a much awaited refunding plan. It will start with an auction of $112 billion next week to refund $102.2 billion of T notes set to mature November 15th. Here to break it all down for us is our very own Jared Blakery. Jared, this is something that people are watching as much as the Fed decision. Rochelle, it really is because uh, nobody really knows about the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee. But I'll tell you what, I've been following them for since the global financial crisis. This is a group uh, made up of some of the representatives of the largest investment banks like J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, that advises the Treasury. And they tell the Treasury, well, we've looked at the marketplace. Here's how much we think you should issue in debt in various maturities. And then the Treasury takes that into consideration and then they uh, issue their guidelines. We now know, and let's go to the Wi-Fi Interactive, what the auction sizes are going to be next week. Now, as you said, this is actually more than uh, the previous uh, quarter. We have 48 billion in three-year notes, 40 billion in 10-year, and 24 billion in 30-year for a total of 112 billion. But that's actually a little bit less, two billion less than the TBAC or the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee had talked about with and recommended to the Treasury. I want to show you something that's happened over the last quarter, and this is a tremendous rise in yields. This is the U.S. Treasury curve. Over here, we have the short end, which is higher than the long end, uh, and it's inverted. Now, the top line is where the yield curve is today. The bottom is where it was three months ago, and there is an 85 basis point increase in the 30-year. And this was a huge topic of discussion for the Treasury with its advisory committee, and they were talking about it being the effect of term premium. Basically, that's a catch-all. That's a, that's a catch-all category that uh, is basically representing what investors would be compensated to take on the risk in a Treasury market if they purchase that security. So here's what they're saying. Term premium entered the quarter at historically low levels, even though these low levels had persisted for many years. But they talk about the fundamental factors going on in the, in the Treasury market and why those yields may be screaming higher. QE, pension fund asset re relocation, reallocation, caps on money market fund assets, a decreasing fraction of U.S. Treasury supply going to overseas holders. That's China. That's Japan. Bank shortening duration. The bottom line is there's a huge amount going on in the Treasury market, which is not completely understood. I want to just fast forward here to a couple more slides I have. This is this shows that the direction of Treasury auctions that is going up. Increased supply means um, we could see uh, higher Treasury rates. And finally, just want to leave you with this. The U.S. debt servicing costs are rising. This is 2023. We're pushing $600 billion. It's a political football. But you can see, based on this chart, that the Treasury market is in the forefront, whereas uh, it was kind of taking a back seat in investor minds probably prior to last year. Yeah, that mounting debt, certainly one of the big reasons why investors are watching this so closely. Jared Blickery, can count on you for a lesson in bonds there. Appreciate the time. Thank you. All right, all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
so-called Magnificent Seven have led the stock market so far in 2023, but the companies hit a fork in the road in October with Amazon and Microsoft posting the only gains greater than 1% from the group. Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer is here with the details. Uh, Josh, what's behind the divergence? Yeah, Kiko, so when you take a look at the seven stocks and look at who gained and who lost over the last month, you can pick out some pretty clear narratives from earnings, right? And what we've heard from these companies thus far. So you see Amazon and Microsoft both up there. They both told pretty positive cloud stories to investors, and they also sold AI and how it's going to contribute to revenue early on very successfully to investors versus when you remember Google's results. And generally speaking, investors were a little bit disappointed in the AI pitch, at least for how quickly AI is going to contribute to revenues. And then when you take a look at Tesla, remember Tesla at times has been an AI story, at least in the long run, when you think about full self-driving, but zooming in on what's going on with Tesla right now, there's just a lot of headwinds there. The same could be said for NVIDIA. Those companies both have big short-term headwinds and concerns with investors. So we see that AI narrative taking a little bit of a backseat to immediate returns. But I also want to take a look at what's been happening with these stocks really just over the past couple months. When you look at how far they've come in, they've come down off their highs. It's been interesting to just see investors basically say valuations might have been too high for some of these companies. When you look at how the Magnificent Seven is still valued compared to the S&P 500, a lot of investors have said, you know, valuations just might be too high right now. They're starting to come down. You wonder at what point people see an attractive entry point here for some of these stocks. But overall, it's been a little bit of a valuation story too. And we think about the MAG7 and that run up we had to start 2023. At some point, people are going to want to take profits and companies to take profits from are companies like these stocks who have grown significantly this year. Indeed. I mean, they really have led the charge this year. And of course, yeah, people are going to want to take their profits off there. Appreciate you giving us that update, our very own Josh Schaefer. Well, taking a look at shares of Estee Lauder plunging this morning after the beauty brand struggled with weakening sales in China during the first quarter, leading the company to slash its full year outlook as its CEO expects incremental external headwinds to persist. Now, Estee Lauder shares are down over 50 percent so far this year, almost 60 percent. So Susan Anderson, Can Accord Genuity Managing Director, joins us now to break down what we've seen from this earnings report and what's been happening with Estee Lauder. So first, let's let's talk about some of the biggest contributors here that they cited, the slowdown in um, Asia travel retail, but especially China as well. What are your takeaways from where Estee Lauder goes from here? Yeah, so it's really China and travel retail that drove, um, you know, the the worst results and the lowered guidance for the year. Um, If it wasn't for those two things, the rest of the business, you know, in all regions saw growth. So it's they have about 30 percent exposure when you combine that travel retail and China um, business. And so that's really driving the weaker results versus competitors um, because of the higher exposure there. So, you know, we expect that to continue into second quarter, which is why they lowered the numbers there. And then ex- they're expecting an inflection in the back half of their fiscal year, which we're, you know, we're still uncertain whether or not that will happen. I think it really depends on macro in China and if we can see some better results there. Um, but so far, we've been seeing things get worse. Yeah, going into the results, Susan, uh, you had a price target of $146 a share on the stock. I'm looking at where it's trading right now, roughly $105. Are are you maintaining that, given what we've heard from the company now? Well, we've seen, um, you know, earnings are going to come down significantly across the board once we see where the street lands, just because of, you know, the the lower guidance. So they lowered earnings guidance for the year to 217 to 242 versus their prior guidance of 350 to 375. So a a pretty big cut there. So we'll have to see how things, you know, pan out um, after the numbers come in. And Susan, as you look at some of the strongest performing aspects of Estee Lauder's business, how does that stack up against some of these other sort of prestige and expensive um, cosmetic companies as well? 
Yeah, so, you know, we've heard China weakness across the board, really, from all of SA Lauder's competitors. It's just that SA Lauder has higher exposure there. Um, you know, the prestige business in the U.S. continued to be very good. They said that growth in the U.S. was mid-single-digit growth, so, you know, fairly strong. Um, and then also in other international markets, double-digit growth. So, you know, it's really that China, um, Asia travel business that's kind of weighing on their results. Otherwise, prestige continues to be strong elsewhere. And is your expectation that that kind of momentum can be maintained? Uh, you know, when you consider where the economy could be headed, certainly the recession calls seem to be pulled back. But um, the expectation yeah. is that consumers are becoming a little more discriminatory in what they buy. Yeah. So, you know, we've been waiting for prestige to pull back all year, really, as consumers get more and more pinched in the wallet. But we just have not seen that. I would expect it to slow somewhat, you know, back down to call it like mid to high single digit growth. Um, you know, last quarter it was still running in the double digit growth ter territory. Um, but, you know, I would think as we come up against tougher compares and the consumers get more and more pinched in the wallet that, you know, potentially we just see it more normalized, but it still does appear that they're buying prestige products. And Susan, when people do sort of step back from prestige projects, if they do like an elf or they decide to, you know, look at the ordinary that's also within Estee Lauder's um, holdings there, do those kinds of consumers tend to come back when things get better? Yeah, they do. So, you know, we, we've we seen a very big increase, though, in Mastige, particularly skincare products, you know, sold at Target, which is right where Naturium sits, which is what Elf bought a, a um, couple months ago. So, you know, we think that there has been some trade down into that Mastige category, not necessarily mass, but, you know, a level above Mastige. And that, you know, could start to hurt prestige products a little bit. The question mark is, do they come back, I guess, afterwards? I think, you know, you still get some better quality and um, better results with, with some higher end prestige products. So I do think the consumer still wants to buy those prestige products. They just have to pick and choose where they want to spend their money. And even as Ulta says, they're seeing more trade around the store. So consumers are really mixing and matching products more than what they used to, whereas they may buy some mass products, some mastige products, and then some prestige products. So they're really picking and choosing where they want to spend their dollars these days. Susan Anderson, Canaccord Genuity Managing Director. Interesting insight there. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Well, all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You are watching Yahoo Finance.
WeWork may be making headlines with its reported Chapter 11 filing to come, but bankruptcies have been slowly increasing for a while. The third quarter closed with the most bankruptcies so far in 2023, according to S&P Global Market Intelligence. September saw another 62 companies file for bankruptcy, bringing the third quarter's total to 182. Now, S&P Global Market Intelligence cites the Fed maintaining its interest rate policy, leaving the economy in a higher for longer environment as adding to economic economic pressures. And healthcare saw the majority of companies leaving the industry, marking its second consecutive month as the sector with the most bankruptcies. It's interesting because a lot of the, the firms that also went bankrupt were zombie firms, these unprofitable companies that just stay afloat by taking on new debt. And that ends up having a domino effect. You have these banks that are investing, you know, Ad, letting them have this debt and then hoping that they'll turn things around and then and they're not. So it's interesting to see though healthcare though still as the consecutive one really taking the biggest losses here. Yeah, a bit of a shakedown happening. I mean, you could argue that, you know, maybe that's not necessarily a bad thing when you talk about those unprofitable companies, but really it does come back down to those higher rates we've been talking about. You know, Jared earlier was talking about the treasury auction, the additional issuing of treasury bonds. Government debt is becoming more expensive because of higher rates. It's no different for corporate debt as well. So, you know, you think about some of those names that have already gone bankrupt this year, Bed Bath & Beyond, Yellow's another one, Smile Direct Club. I mean, these are all companies that were already struggling with high debt even before the Fed started this Fed hiking cycle. So not entirely surprising, but curious to see how much more of a shakedown happens as we maintain these rates for longer. Well, shares of major real estate names like Zillow and Redfin are on the move today. This comes on the heels of a recent ruling from a Missouri jury saying that the National Association of Realtors, Home Services and Keller Williams all colluded to inflate high brokerage commissions. On top of that, the Justice Department is, is also looking into the commission sharing system. The ruling could bring about changes in how real estate agents make profits. And, you know, Rochelle, anybody who's been out looking for a home is familiar to these commission sharing structures that are available, essentially making that price a little higher, especially for the seller that is on the hook. In some cases, 5% to 6% of the cut of the sale price. We saw the investigation happen under the Trump administration. The uh, NAR settled under that. The Biden administration has said that they want their options available to pursue further uh, antitrust cases against that. But it's only going to be in focus, especially right now, when you consider where the housing market is and how things have slowed and scaled back dramatically. No, it's true. And even though we're seeing Zillow taking, you know, some of the, the brunt of this and its stock price, also Compass and Redfield feeling the fallout there, they weren't actually named in the lawsuit. It's Keller Williams, Berkshire Hathaway's Home Services of America were also named in that suit with the NAR about colluding to maintain these high brokerage commissions. But it just goes to show that, you know, obviously investors take, taking a second look here, wondering if this is going to be a structural issue that we're going to continue to see the DOJ pressing on. And we know that the Biden administration is already cracking down on other areas of different kinds of junk fees that are that are really affecting consumers. So to see the DOJ here pursuing this also, I think is, is sending some, some, some shockwaves here for investors for some of these companies who weren't even named in the suit, but have some of these repercussions also facing them as well. Well, shifting gears here, millennials are apparently embracing investing into exchange-traded funds more than any other generation. That's according to a new study from Schwab Asset Management. Now, those born between the years of 1981 and 1996 have 45% of their portfolios in fixed income, compared to only 31% of those in the baby boomer generation. And it's only set to increase, as Schwab found that 51% of millennials have plans to invest in bond ETFs in 2024. Let's bring investors Vice Chair Tom Lydon to discuss ETF strategy. So what are we seeing here in terms of why we're seeing so much of a, a push here from that generation versus baby boomers who, who tend to usually like this bond market and like this fixed income space? Well, uh, you're right, Rochelle. Uh, those of us baby boomers, and I'm a baby baby boomer, most of us started investing when mutual funds were hot and we never sold. Uh, however, there is a transition that's going on. I was at the Schwab Institutional Conference last week in Philadelphia, and ETFs are all the buzz. But behind the scenes, there's some important information. There's $7 trillion in ETFs in the US, and only 20% is in fixed income. However, so far this year, about an equal amount, $150 billion has gone into US equity ETFs, 
and U.S. income ETFs, and especially during a time when we've had rising interest rates. I think the secret is, as we're surveying advisors all the time, most feel that the Fed, if they're not done, they're close to being done of hiking interest rates, and most feel that rates will be lower a year from now, so there's not only an opportunity to go longer duration, to lock in that yield, but also pick up on some appreciation if rates actually are cut in the next 12 months. Yeah, Tom, that 45% is a pretty impressive number when you talk about just one subset, right? I mean, we're talking about a specific demographic here. How much of that is recent inflows? Makes sense, given where yields are. How much of that is about sort of that having that safety net, the, the risk averse sort of steady play when it comes to bonds? Well, Akiko, part of it is the ease of investing, and that's kind of what ETFs are all about. When you when you think about the online platforms, whether it's brokerage or wealth management, it just makes it very easy. It's very inexpensive compared to mutual funds or active management. Uh, it's tax efficient, where you're not getting year-end distributions, which is a whole other story that's going to be talked about in the next 30 days. So for this new generation of investors, being able to invest on your phone, get broad diversification for low cost and tax efficiency, it makes all the sense in the world. And we're seeing net redemptions in these uh, long in the tooth mutual funds as more and more money is shifting over. Look, it's not that our generation, the older generation, the baby boomers don't like ETFs. They love ETFs and they're gradually shifting over too. However, they've been investing and brought up in the mutual fund world that has served them very nicely. And so for people who have been pouring into things like money market funds and looking for some perhaps some alternatives here, what are some of the picks that you like? Well, look, a couple things. When we were talking about going long duration, um, one of uh, the ETFs, TLT, which is the iShares 20-year treasury, uh, they, they had $3 billion go in just in the last 30 days. So if you feel that we're top ticking rates at this point, you can actually get a decent yield and actually participate in some appreciation as well. Outside of that area, there's alternative income strategies that have just been exploding. They're led by JP Morgan's equity premium ETF, JEPI, J-E-P-I, where you're actually getting almost 1% a month in alternative income. And this income is options overlay strategies, not even tied to the fixed income market or the Fed. So it's another way to get regular income, but you're diversifying away from whatever the Fed action is. And then finally, managed futures is an area that's really coming on strong in the ETF space. The IMGP DBI Managed Future ETF is an opportunity to participate in not just rising interest rates where they'll be going short, but also you've got uh, currency that's wrapped in there. So the dollar continues to look strong over time and also commodities. So they manage futures in a variety of different ways where you can actually participate in that, diversifying away from bonds and stocks that many people have been doing for the last two years. What about something like corporate credit, Tom? We're talking fixed income. Yeah, so cor corporate credit, uh, absolutely. So you, you look at areas like JNK, which is the largest, one of the largest corporate credit ETFs, uh, great yield, and really back to the point of money market funds, $7 trillion in money market funds, fantastic, getting almost 5%. But if advisors are right and markets are right, that rates are gonna be a lower a year from now, that 5% yield isn't going to be there. And if you're stuck in money market funds, you're going to miss out on some appreciation as well. So the key is don't just be waiting there, feeling comfortable with your powder dry. You have to start looking where the puck's going to be a year from now. And advisors are starting to do that. There's more money in motion in the fixed income ETF area than we've ever seen. Time to start putting some of that cash to work. Tom Leiden, Vetify Vice Chair. Uh, appreciate you joining us uh, for today's ETF report brought to you by Invesco QQQ. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
2023 rocked the markets. NVIDIA, the stock has been on a tear. Silicon Valley week. Bank's collapse is the second largest bank failure in the U.S. Inflation, mortgage rates, the diabetes drug, Ozempic. Now it's time to make bold decisions. Yahoo Finance Invest, the marquee event for investors seeking big ideas and bold decisions. Guided by the newsroom you trust. Don't miss it. November 7th, exclusively on Yahoo Finance. JetBlue Airways is in court this week to defend its acquisition of budget airline Spirit against the Justice Department. The $3.8 billion deal would create the fifth largest airline in the U.S. Now, JetBlue says the acquisition is necessary to compete with other big names in the airline space. But regulators argue the deal would raise costs and harm cost-conscious flyers. For more on this, Steve Trent, City Airline Analyst, joins us now. So, so talk about this argument here, because JetBlue is saying that growth from other discount airlines is going to fill the void from this merger. But from what you're seeing, would that actually be true? Well, good morning, and thank you for having me on, uh, first off. Uh, I think that's at least partially true. If one looks at what JetBlue has proposed in terms of airport slots, it does look to relinquish uh, some slots to, uh, you know, Frontier uh, and Allegiant in the Northeast uh, and possibly uh, some of the uh, Fort Lauderdale assets uh, that Spirit has, for example, assuming uh, that the two are, are allowed to merge. Um, so I think for JetBlue's purposes, in addition to competition, I think this is at least partially about JetBlue needing the equipment uh, and the pilots um, and acquiring Spirit uh, would arguably get them there. Steve, what's the case you're operating under right now? I mean, you've got a neutral rating on the stock, specifically on Spirit. You've talked about the fallout that could happen if this falls through. What's the base case as it stands for you? Yeah, certainly. So uh, at this juncture, quite frankly, uh, the merger can really go either way. Uh, I don't have enough confidence uh, that it is going to go through uh, that I'm actually incorporating the spirit acquisition uh, into our JetBlue estimates at this juncture. The other thing that is really hanging out there, um, if one looks at the economic conditions we've seen uh, for JetBlue and Spirit over the last year, uh, both carriers are on track to report losses for this year. Um, you know, and Spirit on our numbers, those losses, uh, earnings losses extend into 2025. Uh, we now have a GTF engine issue. Um, in addition to the equity consideration, Spirit Airlines has over $5 billion of net debt. So economically speaking, how is JetBlue going to do that? That's not 100% clear. Uh, I think as a first step, you know, it would be good to know, for instance, uh, if the government's going to allow this to happen. You know, and then I think we'd cross that bridge when we get there. But at this juncture... Uh, we are not considering uh, spirit in our uh, JetBlue estimates. So then, Steve, when you look at the, the fees that tend to get tacked on for, for spirit airlines at the moment, that you, I mean, people do always say, you know, there's been lots of jokes and memes online about, you know, all the different fees that end up coming in versus what you would pay with some of these bigger airlines. When it comes to what is actually cost conscious for the consumer then, how strong is that argument? Um... I mean, I do think that if, uh, if, if spirit disappears, uh, will the United States have uh, one less ultra low cost carrier? Yes. Um, you know, I think the second piece of the pie there uh, is what can that segment of the market bear? Uh, because if one looks at, uh, for example, you know, your typical premium economy passenger on, on Delta or United Airlines, uh, that economic profile of that passenger arguably is in better shape than uh, you know a, a passenger looking for the cheapest tickets on uh, an ultra low cost flight uh, where the latter passenger might be sensitive about checking a bag uh, in order to avoid fees. Um, so when we look at where the markets migrated, uh, we've actually seen a, a really important inflection relative to the pandemic. Uh, the network airlines are doing 
much better. Uh, and the ultra low cost carriers and discount carriers generally, uh, we think face some headwinds uh, in terms of where are those consumers in more modest economic profiles versus the typical person taking a economy plus or first class on Delta United. And so how, what are some of the changes that you're seeing airlines making as they adjust to the sort of post-revenge travel period here and looking at perhaps new international routes and, and other sources of growth here? What is going to be the next catalyst for airlines? Yeah, absolutely. So if you're an international long-haul airline, we think 2024, uh, it's going to be uh, efficiently adding metal onto those markets where transatlantic has been strong. And we would say that Trans-Pacific probably has some good legs to run on um, as we look at the next several quarters because the comps are, are relatively easy. And then I think when we think about the post-pandemic world, what's changed and how much of this is structural, I think some of it might be structural um, based in part on many consumers no longer in the office five days a week. So there's more Hybrid, tri uh, excuse me, hybrid type travel uh, relative to 2019. Maybe your typical pre-pandemic close-in booking strength is not what it used to be. So those New York to Boston day trips are definitely uh, far from pre-pandemic level. So with that in mind, uh, it, you know, it's conceivable uh, that trunk route, mainline, premium economy. Uh, type domestic flow is going to do much better uh, than service at the back of the plane or especially relative to the discount airline. So to the degree that a domestic airline can pivot towards that middle category, uh, you know, it probably uh, economically speaking uh, looks like a, a much better opportunity. And we'll certainly continue to watch that. Appreciate you joining us for your insights. Steve Trent, City Airline Analyst, thank you so much. Pleasure. Well, earnings out this morning from Yum! Brands signaled cheaper meals are king with consumers under pressure. Yum! Brands bet and won big on aggressive promotions and limited time offers at Taco Bell in the U.S., boosting net sales during the quarter. Now, the deals helped pull in budget-strapped consumers searching for those cheaper dining options. Joining us now with more on the state of Yum! Brands consumer is Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma. Hey, Brooke. Good morning, Rochelle. Well, value promotions continue to be the name of the game for Yum! Brands as they navigate the pressures like those return of student loan payments in the U.S. environment. And CEO David Gibbs did say on the call that he believes that Yum! Brands franchisees are navigating those pressures better than others in the industry. He also added that Taco Bell continues to be a bright spot for Yum! Brands. As you noted, we did see U.S. sales for Taco Bell grow 8% year over year. He also added that value purchases remained in the range of the brand's intended 10% mixed target. And on the call, CEO David Gibbs weighed in on how exactly it's benefiting in this environment. If we break down the Taco Bell stores in the United States by income demographic, we see really consistent 2 to 3% transaction growth across all income levels. So our stores in lower income trade areas are performing well with good transaction growth just like our stores in high income trade areas. I think that speaks to the way Taco Bell can play value with things like the $5 box and how also in a pressured consumer environment, we're probably benefiting a little bit from some trade down in those higher income trade areas. And for the remainder of the year, the company does expect that it results will land well above its long-term growth algorithm for the year, including achieving low double-digit core operating profit growth in Q3, that core operating profit grew a 16%, led by KFC International, as well as Taco Bell U.S. But once again, CEO David Gibbs said that they continue to put up strong results. They're seeing plenty of demand, and they think they're demonstrating that they can thrive in any environment. And Brooke, of course, I have to ask you about whether Yum! Brands mentioned any concerns around weight loss drugs impacting consumer habits, something that we've seen sort of starting to come up after, after that Walmart report tied what they saw with some of their pharmacy customers, then instead sort of pairing back on some of these higher fat and, you know, some of these, some of these more fun foods that aren't always great for our waistlines. 
<laughs> right, Rochelle. Well, this is something that you and I have talked about so much over the last uh, month or so, and we continue to hear that it's too early to tell. But there was actually no mention of GLPs. They're known as, also known as weight loss drugs, on the Yum Brands call this morning. There was some questions about it in analyst notes of whether or not it will come up. But we did hear from Steve analyst Chris O'Call in a note saying that restaurants like Taco Bell could be hit by the impact of these weight loss drugs since they are considered snacking uh, companies. People go there during the afternoon or late night hours. We could see a dip in traffic there. But once again, we know that the current U.S. population who are on these drugs is only about 1%. Goldman Sachs does project that we could see as many as 15 million people use these weight loss drugs by 2030. But no mention on the Yum! Brands call of a potential impact from these weight loss drugs. And once again, Rochelle, we continue to hear that it's too early to tell from Wall Street. Indeed. Still still early days yet. As you mentioned, only 1% at the moment. So we'll, we'll have to keep track of that. Our very own Brooke De Palma. Thank you, as always. All right. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Renewable energy stocks continuing to get hammered this morning. The biggest manufacturers among wind turbines and solar panels. We're talking about Enphase, Sunran, Sunrun, and SunPower, just to name a few, are at risk of facing some of its biggest financial challenges in years, thanks to volatile costs and high interest rates. So the question here is how and when will the sector see a long-term rebound? Yahoo Finances and as Foray has the details. Do you have an answer for us, Inez? <laughs> Not right now, but I do have some information about what's happening in the industry overall and what we're seeing with these uh, energy initiatives. Look, uh, when we talk about energy initiatives, what we're talking about with these renewable companies, we're talking about basically two categories here. We're looking at wind and we're also looking at solar. So let's first take a look at what's happening with wind, because there have been wind projects around the world and here in the U.S. 
um, that have been going on. And those are facing some headwinds with those higher interest rates, Akiko, that you had mentioned, the higher cost of capital, inflation, supply issues in the industry as well. And you don't have to look that far in the Northeast. There's some wind offshore wind projects uh, that have been initiated, and those are stalling. In fact, you had some governors recently sending a letter to the Biden administration asking for more clarification on tax credits from that Inflation Reduction Act that was passed last year, basically saying that they need more help to get these projects off the ground since they've been agreed upon because of higher costs, higher labor costs, supply issues, lags with permits, et cetera. Then we're talking also about solar energy. And in the solar energy, those companies that you mentioned, Akiko, being impacted by lagging demand because of these higher interest rates. So let's take a look at what's happening with the solar, solar panel space. Enphase, for example, reported its quarterly results recently, and they're the maker of micro inverters, and those are attached to solar panels. So that stock is down, by the way, about 70% year to date. And the company talking about falling demand in Europe and also falling demand in the U.S. driven by California. There's also happening something happening in the overall solar uh, panel space, and that is that there's a, been a glut of solar panels. So you're seeing some record low margins for companies. It's very difficult for them to make a profit when the cost of those products is continuing to drop. And analysts are saying that panel prices are like Likely to continue to drop into 2023. Fascinating stuff there. We're looking at some of these green energy investments. Appreciate that breakdown. Our very own Ines Ferre. Well, before we go, let's get your final check of the market. Still looking at green across the board, though, off those session highs, perhaps some of those jitters, a little bit of a pullback here as we await what we'll hear from the Fed in the thick of earnings week, as we're widely expected to have the Fed, the Fed hold rate interest rates at the same pace. But we'll be passing through the information, looking to see what he says about future rate hikes. So with that in mind, that's it for now. I'm, I'm Rochelle Akufo, along with Akiko Fujita. Thank you for watching and stay with us here on Yahoo Finance.